and Michael Remus. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you for the next couple hours. Lots to get to as the Jets hit the practice ice today with a little bit of a different look up in those top lines and uh, some... uh, some tweaking of the look of the Jets' offense, which, um, well, frankly, has been a little non-existent as of late as Rick Bonus tries to find something to get his team going in the right direction as they begin a crucial five-game homestand beginning tomorrow, welcoming in the Detroit Red Wings. We're going to talk about it, the aftermath of Tuesday's shutout loss to the San Jose Sharks with Trevor Kidd. Really looking forward to having Kidder on the program, and we'll also chop it up both the short-term and long-term Jets situation with Brandon Rewicki coming up a little later on. And, of course, it is opening day in the majors. Looking forward to welcoming in our pal J.D. Bunkus from Sportsnet in Toronto. Uh, Talk a little Blue Jays going into first pitch this afternoon against the Cardinals, as well as a little bit on um, the Canadian men's soccer team. We just had a big game against Honduras earlier this week in Toronto that J.D. was at. So we'll have that for you at the end of the program, but you know where we're going to start off with the Winnipeg Jets. More on practice and a look ahead to tomorrow's game against the Detroit Red Wings. A couple things right off the bat. Thanks, everyone, that joined us yesterday, one of our biggest shows ever. Uh, And I don't think we've ever had more comments on a show than we did yesterday. And uh, Listen, I was hot, as many of you were getting into yesterday's show um, and sort of went off at the beginning of it. Um, I do appreciate all the comments um, got back from so many Jet fans uh, and really do appreciate that feedback. Um, But you know what? We move on. We'll hear from Rick Bonus uh, in a little bit, hopefully, uh, who spoke after practice today. And certainly I think it cooled down a little bit like uh, many of us after uh, what we heard from Bones after the game on Tuesday. Um, because this team is still in a playoff spot going into an absolutely crucial five-game set at home before they finish up the final two games on the road against the Minnesota Wild and the Colorado Avalanche. So we'll get into all of that. Obviously, we got to talk about last night as well, but I'll bring Michael Remus in to do that just before we get to Remo. A huge thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Our friends at Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, Canadian Club, Culligan Water, Vita Health Fresh Market, Wallace & Wallace, Consolidated Supply, F Apparel, Manitoba Battery, the Nick & Nicky DQ Group, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports. And as always, we'll get to a why not question of the day for our friends over at Not Auto Corp at Waverly and McGilvery. And I can't forget our friends at Little Brown Jug. What great hosts they were last night for our second sports trivia night. And uh, Remo, get in here. I guess on behalf of both of us, we have to thank everyone that came out. What an awesome turnout for a real fun sports trivia night. And of course, a big thanks to the great staff at Little Brown Jug who took such good care of uh, us and all of the WS tiers that packed LBJ last night downtown. Yeah, that was really awesome. Um, so great to see so many people come out, and um, you know, I drove in, and I, you know, I never know how it's gonna go. If you know, I see that people are here in chat, and people are listening, but maybe that doesn't register that there's actually people out there. But yeah, the you couldn't really find a parking spot that close, and the building was full. You couldn't get a seat if you came came late, and um, so great to see so many people. You know, I see a lot of people in chat who were there um, last night. So what an event, and just makes me want to do more of these and we hope to do more in the future. But, um, you know, you, I got to say you has, I could tell you, I mean, you told me you were spending a lot of, uh, nights 
thinking of these questions and they were all well done. And I thought they were certainly weren't the difficulty level. Um, I thought was pretty, was pretty good. It wasn't like anything too crazy out there. So here I'll bring in sure to little Brown jug who sent us some of these pictures from the event. There you are. And sorry, podcast listeners check our Instagram or come here to look, but yeah, here's a bunch of pictures. Of everyone having a great time yesterday. I'll go through these. There's our pal Dom and Mo and Melissa. There's Jeff WST Bellis. legend Jeff Kabilis who came out last night. Special guest appearance by the one and only T. Konopoli who came a little later on as well. But Phyllis and Bridget was there. I mean, obviously we can't go through everyone. Got a chance to meet Julian Labossier who is, I think, right there yeah. in that photo for the first time. And uh, all in all, I mean, you know, it's just so neat to actually be able to connect in person with so many people that uh, are such a big part of the show every day through uh, the live chat on YouTube. And, uh, oh, Leighton Janice is in that photo. i got to give a shout-out to Leighton, who traveled 2,000 kilometers to join us yesterday at Little Brown Jug, coming all the way from the West Coast. Excellent work by Leighton to time his trip back home um, to join us at Little Brown Jug. So, uh, all in all, the beer was amazing. Got a chance to try that generic lager, which uh, was very popular last night, the newest offering from Little Brown Jug. Um, but overall, it was just uh, an absolute blast. And I joked yesterday that we would have crisis counselors on hand for uh, Jets fans to kind of vent. I did my venting at the beginning of yesterday's program. Uh, but I think in a lot of ways, it was somewhat therapeutic for everyone to get together, um, have a little fun, maybe get away from the things that had been uh, driving people crazy for a few for the last few weeks. Um, have a few great beers, uh, do a few brain buster trivia questions. And uh, at the end of the day, just get the Winnipeg Sports Talk crew back together. So, again, staff at Little Brown Jug, unbelievable. Special thanks to Cal for helping us uh, set that whole thing up and uh the bottom line was we had a great, great turnout, a real good time, and I cannot wait to do it again, hopefully in the summer, back outside on that amazing patio at Little Brown Jug like we did for the first episode of WST Sports Trivia when we uh, did the first time. Yeah, that was so much fun uh, last year when we did it outside. They have a wonderful patio, and I just remember that was actually like our kind of third in-person event there because we did the live show there on the day um, – <laughs> Barry Trotz announced he wasn't going to return to coaching, oh, and that, that was one. that was a crazy string. So this was, um, I mean, great season. And I, one thing too, a lot of people wore jerseys. We didn't like say it was a jersey dress code, but I'll have to bring one out. I think next time, uh, if we do a sports trivia event, where rock a, a good sports jersey. So that was, I mean, awesome seeing everyone out there. Um, you know, tried a bunch of the, the different beers from Little Brown Jug too, which was exciting. A uh, nice room there, and again, I, has I give you props for leading that event and coming up with all the questions because uh, that wasn't easy coming up with those, and I had fun playing along too. Hey, it was a uh, it was a bit of a labor of love. I've always, I mean, I had such a good time. I hosted the uh, Pub Stumpers trivia for years down at Elephant Castle, and. Um, always just had so much fun. I mean, listen, I think most people know me. I don't mind hanging out in a bar for a few hours. That's for sure. And, uh, oh, listen, it was, uh, it was fun doing it back then. And the opportunity to do this at little Brown jug with so many people that are such a big part of our program, uh, was exactly what we were hoping. And, uh, it exceeded everyone's expectations. So thanks again to everyone to, who came out, stay tuned. We'll work on a date at some point when it gets nice outside, and we will do this again in the coming months. And if you weren't able to join us, make sure you do next time. Um, let's get to uh, let's get down to business for today, Remo, because as I said, we're going to be talking with Trevor Kidd coming up in a few minutes on um, everything going on around the Winnipeg Jets. Trevor was awesome on the OV post game show on Tuesday night, which went very very late, along with of course a legal curve and. Kenny and Rennie, who finished up in and around 2 a.m. Um, still a lot of shrapnel coming out of that game. And again, what we heard from Mark Shifley and Rick Bonus after the game. So we'll be getting to that coming up with um, uh, with Trevor and with Brandon. Um, but let's focus on practice right now because this team needs to figure it out and needs to figure it out now. And a pretty interesting move today, Remo, 
when uh, Rick Bonus had his lines together at practice. I know we spent a lot of time talking about Mark Shifley. Mm. This team needs a lot more from Mark Shifley. It needs a lot more from all of their top offensive players to get things going offensively. And I think in a move that really speaks to the urgent situation the Winnipeg Jets are in, Mark Shifley has actually been moved off of center and will now be playing on the wing with Pierre-Luc Dubois and Kyle Connor. And I heard Kelly Moore earlier today saying, I think the one time this team, this unit came together was in a December game against the Minnesota Wild. Of course, at that time, the Jets were completely depleted injury-wise. This is a very different story right now. They need to find their way offensively. And listen, I'm sure Rick Bonus hasn't been too pleased with some of the things that Mark Shafley has done from a center position. So maybe you move him onto the wing with a little bit of defensive, less defensive responsibilities, and you put him with two of the most impactful offensive players on the team in Pierre-Luc Dubois and Kyle Connor, and hopefully see if we can, uh, you know, might get some better, uh, better results. The other side to that is the second line, and it's Vlad Nemetsnikov who is going to be in the middle of Nikolai Ehlers and Blake Wheeler. Now, uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about Shifley. I think Wheeler's also a main focus, 21 games without a goal, and has really sort of seen who have lost his way as well. Um, I had said yesterday on the program when we finished up, I would like to see uh, Nino Niederreiter maybe go on with Adam Lowry. Um, but I was thinking that Nikolai Ehlers would be the guy that would be playing along with Connor and Dubois. Um, but Ehlers is going to be counted on to be the offensive driver of that second line. And certainly from Bones' perspective, uh, you know, spoke with the guys, according to him, and we'll hear these comments hopefully a little bit later on. The guys were gung-ho about the move. Um, and I guess that's a good sign. There hasn't seemed to be a lot of gung-ho when it comes to certain players over the course of the last little while and uh, trying to find a way to snap out of this crazy offensive funk that has really put the Jets in the situation that they're in right now. Yeah, how crazy is this offensive funk? We've talked about the Jets' record since January 17th. I think it's fourth worst in the league in terms of uh, you know points per game. How about goals per game? Since January 17th, do you know where the Winnipeg Jets rank in goals per game? Hustler. Since since in January 17th, of course, the uh, yes. libel's appearance. Yes. The beginning yeah. the beginning of the downward spiral of the Jets. I'm going to guess that they are 32nd out of 32 teams in the NHL. And that is some good trivia, Huss, and you would be absolutely correct. They are dead oh. last in the league in goals per game over the last two-plus months of the season. And I think that's why this is so astonishing because they were like, what, 10th? I think they were like... 10th to 15th range. I got to double check um, from the beginning of the season to that point. And they were, you know what their record was and their goals per game is almost an entire goal less. And it's absolutely incredible with this kind of talent that they would have such trouble scoring. Um, and their power play. We, I mean, part of that is the power play too. The power play has been fourth worst in the league since then. I'm going to have to double check that one, but it's near, near the bottom. And we know they're on this, this stretch, and we know that uh, what you know, Shifley, Dubois, Honor on the stretch. They need those three guys to start scoring goals, and I like putting Ehlers back in the Mesnikov. I wonder about Blake Wheeler, Huss. I mean, I think Morgan Barron. I don't like. I don't think he's a fourth line guy. I think he needs to play third line, you know, maybe second. So maybe I don't know what they end up doing, but they keep giving Wheeler all this, all this ice time, and you know, we know he hasn't scored well, but I don't. Like, I'm not as concerned that Wheeler is not scoring because he's not a goal scorer. He's a passer. He reminds me of, like, uh, you know, Henrik Sedin or a Joe Thornton where you maybe you get 10 goals and, like, 50 assists or something like that at, at this point in his career. So, you know, maybe they'll be able to create. He can set up those guys for some goals. But I think Ehlers needs to be the guy in that line. He's been the only guy who's been, been going. It's going to be up to the top line, and the Jets are going to go as far as that top line goes. You know, I like putting Shafley on the wing. We've seen him at center, and he's on for a lot of goals against. But Connor has also been on for a lot of goals against. And I don't know if playing those guys together is optimal, but I'm not an NHL coach. I'm just a guy in my basement here on YouTube. So I'll defer <laughs> defer to them for this one. <laughs> hey, um, listen, they got to try something. Um, and, you know, I know that there's a lot of folks that, you know, we're talking to coming out of that game where you put guys in the press box or bench. I mean, that's... It's not happening with seven games left in the regular season, especially knowing that they absolutely need to find a way to score goals. And 
like it or not, Mark Scheifele is and uh, will continue to be in this current um, roster co- uh, construction one of the most important offensive players, and they have to find a way to get him more engaged, but also bottom line producing right now, and the production just hasn't been there. So Shifley on the wing with Connor in Dubois, that's how, you know, how things go. And I just saw somebody mention that they can call that the bye-bye byline. Um, <laughs> we're going to get to some comments that Darren Drager had about the future of Pierre-Luc Dubois and the Winnipeg Jets coming up in a couple minutes. Uh, but as we mentioned for you guys on the podcast that can't see this, Ehlers with the Metznikoff and Wheeler. Uh, Nino Niederreiter, Adam Lowry, Mason Appleton on the third line, and Baron Stenny and Saku Menelainen for the fourth line right now. Defense pairings, uh, Morrissey with Pionk, Dylan and DeMello, and Sandberg and Schmidt. And, of course, uh, we expect to see a lot of Connor Hellebuck going forward, and uh, we'll get that start tomorrow night. Interestingly enough, and we'll talk about this more heading into the Detroit game, uh, the uh, Vili Husso. The, the Wings number one goalie out for at least a week. So uh, it doesn't look like he'll be available for the Red Wings tomorrow. But uh, before we get back to the present, um, as well as more fallout from Tuesday's game with Trevor Kidd, let's talk about what Darren Drager had to say. And Drager is interesting. I mean, we all, often hear tidbits from insiders on the Winnipeg Jets. Hadn't been a lot as of late, but all of a sudden right now with where the Winnipeg Jets are, they are one of the biggest topics in the National Hockey League. What has happened to this club? How they ended up in this situation considering where they were a couple of months ago, as well as what is the future for this team? I think a lot of people believe that there will be significant changes. Now, I know we saw some people going back and forth with us on Twitter about uh, a rebuild, a retool. I mean, a lot of it is semantics. There are going to be some significant changes, but on a team that still has Connor Hellebuck and Nikolai Ehlers and Kyle Connor and Josh Morrissey, um, you know, it's not going to be a massive implosion, but I think there will be some significant moves. I think Mark Scheifele and Blake Wheeler would be at the top of that list, but the future of Pierre-Luc Dubois is a topic that certainly was uh, driving a lot of eyeballs to this program last summer, Remo, and it doesn't sound like that is going to change at all when we get to the offseason, knowing that the Winnipeg Jets have one more year of control over Pierre-Luc Dubois, and I think that really kind of forces them into a decision because, as I've said for a long time, you just simply cannot run this back for another year and risk losing an asset like Dubois for nothing. And I don't believe that is at all in the plans for the Winnipeg Jets. No, I don't think so at all. And he's, we know he's got one more year of team control and RFA after this season. And, you know, I, I think Pierre Luc Dubois, Dubois is going to want to cash in kind of like Matthew Kachuk did. This is the time. However, I mean, his second half, you know, really tanked his value. The first half of the year has, I was like, this guy, he's a, t-, you know, if he's point per game, he's $10 million player here. Uh, he's 24. He's turning 25. In June, this is the prime. But you look at his numbers, you know, what was he, October, November, December. Uh, I mean, he was December. He had 20 points in 16 games, November 14 and 12. Uh, he had, you know, started off six points in nine games. Uh, and then the last couple months, it just hasn't gone well. And this was uh, in his last 26 games, has nine points while averaging. All under just under 20 minutes, 18:38 in ice time. It's not exactly what you want from your number one center, or number two, nine points in 26 games. So um, I'm not really sure what is going to happen with him, but we keep hearing all these rumors about him linked to Montreal, and I don't mean I don't think the Jets should just give him away to Montreal if that's where he wants to go. I mean, maybe there's some other contender who does want a center and play him at number one or number two. But it's certainly going to be fascinating this summer what happens. What happens with Dubois and his future? Well, it, exactly. And, and, and I'll say this. Um, irregardless of what happens with Shifley and Wheeler and other moves, the Winnipeg Jets can't trade Pierre-Luc Dubois for, you know, 70 cents on the dollar. They need to get full value. And I'm sure that they'll, if they do exhaust, and we're going to hear what the plan is, I mean, they're going to take another crack at Dubois. If they're unable to do that, and they've got an offer that makes sense, whether it's from the Montreal Canadiens or somebody else, I think they do that. 
What if that offer isn't there? I do see a possibility of Dubois coming back next season, being with the Winnipeg Jets on another one-year deal. And, and I, I guess part of the reason I think that is, is that, I mean, look at the prices paid at the deadline this year for players. Um, a guy with the resume of Dubois, with the skill set of Dubois, with the size and the physicality that he can play with, I mean, that is a guy that, you know, you would want to have for the playoffs. And, um, while I know fans might be impatient, um, and listen, it might be very difficult, depending on where the team is next year, to trade a player like that, uh, I'm not sure that they would have any other choice. And I mean, from the general manager's perspective, whenever you make that deal, if you're forced into it, you have to make the best deal possible. And I think there's absolutely an argument that the best time to trade Pierre-Luc Dubois might actually be at the deadline next year. Now, we'll have plenty of time to talk about that, but... And, you know, again, whether it's Elliot Friedman or Jeff Merrick or um, certainly Nick Kiprios is saying that Dubois is not coming back to Winnipeg. Um, certainly, if you listen to Darren Drager and when he jumped on in Montreal, the Winnipeg Jets, I don't think, have thrown up the white flag on that just yet. Here's what Drager had to say. Jump it on with uh, Connor McKenna and Simon Salkis on a 690 in Montreal. Um, Dreg saying the Jets are... Not quitting on this one. We'll do everything they can to try and sign Dubois. Here's what Dregs had to say. All we can tell you is that the Winnipeg Jets are going to do everything within their power to try and extend Pierre-Luc Dubois. If it is Pierre-Luc Dubois' wish to become a member of the Montreal Canadiens, well, do we really think that Kevin Chevalier off in the Winnipeg Jets are just going to gift Dubois? To Montreal. So let's start breaking apart what that looks like. Because based on what we saw from Rick Bonus post game last night, he is not happy with that group. He's not happy. He's not happy with Mark Shifley. He's not happy with Dubois. He's not happy with Wheeler. Go down the list. I mean, yeah, that was pretty evident last night. All right. So there's uh, Dregs just, um, you know, mentioning it, the Winnipeg Jets, uh, <laughs> certainly speaking to the current situation with the Jets and how unhappy Rick Bonus and the coaching staff is with the contributions of some of their most important players. But big picture, Dubois, such a key asset, especially when you consider what this team and organization gave up to get him here to Winnipeg, um, that there are going to be some big decisions going forward. But not until they exhaust all possibilities to try to re-sign Dubois. Here's a little bit more from uh, Dreger on that visit with TSN 690 in Montreal. Hockey Insider. Oh, wrong clip. <laughs> oh, jeez. Hold on, I don't. I didn't save it or something. Oh, okay. We'll get to that. Uh, Give me one bit. sec. Give me one sec. No I'm problem. Thinking. We'll fire that up. Um, you know, when you I know, was doing it, this was my worst nightmare. Being like, oh, I better make sure I save these. I don't want to look like a dummy on the show and not have it, not have yeah, it ready. Self fulfilling prophecy. I, I like had visions of like going to the clip and it not being ready. Here we are. One sec. All right, we'll uh, we'll pull that up. I'm just looking at uh, you know some of the chats today uh, from folks in on it. Um, a lot of people talking about Shifley on the wing with PLD for practice, uh, and yes, waiters mentioning that it's the wrong clip. Uh, Rob Mahoney, no excuses, just solutions from Remo, and uh, we get into that. As I say. When it comes down to it, I mean, I don't have a huge amount of optimism that. The Jets will be able to re-sign Pierre-Luc Dubois. I mean, I have no inside information, but when you hear over and over and over again from people that are quite dialed in and connected in the National Hockey League saying that he's as good as gone, I mean, that sort of takes a life of its own. Um, but it's incumbent on the Winnipeg Jets to do everything they can to exhaust all of those opportunities. But as they say, if if there's a deal, if they can't do that and there's a deal this summer that makes sense, you pulled the trigger on it. But I think they also know that there could be a real premium for a player of Dubois' package at the trade deadline next year for a contending team. And, you know, again, it's not easy to trade one of your top centers at that at that time. But like we saw with the St. Louis Blues this year, as well as a number of other teams, um, sometimes you, you have to make those tough decisions for the long term um, that cost you a little bit in the short term right now. Um, but I just go back to it as an asset 
Dubois, so important. Can you convince him to re-sign? That would be great. I'm certainly not holding my breath on that situation considering everything else that we've heard. Um, but I don't think, unlike a Shifley situation, I don't think the it would be absolutely incumbent that they would have to do it in the summer. I think Dubois has big, big value at the trade deadline, maybe more than anybody else on the on that roster outside of a Connor Hellebuck who's in an entirely different situation, um, but in some ways the same with one year left of team control, although doesn't need a contract for next year, unlike, uh, unlike Dubois. How are we going with that clip? Yeah, I got it here. That was... <laughs> this is like I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Sorry, everyone. It's it's all good. It's all good. But uh anyways, here's just a little bit more from uh from Drager. Um talking about Pierre Luc Dubois, the Winnipeg Jets on TSN six ninety in Montreal. Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna edit all this junk out. <laughs> uh the people if, on the YouTube show get to see the magic. Yeah. Here. If if Dubois is to get moved by Winnipeg um, what comes back in return? Montreal will have to pay a premium if they're not willing to wait until he becomes a, a free agent, right? Uh, and then you've got the Mark Shifley factor in Winnipeg with all sorts of rumblings that are just going to amplify between now and the end of the season. If he doesn't get it back on track, you know, is the time right to consider moving him? Well, now you've, you, you're, you're down your two primary centers in Winnipeg. How do you recoup that? I don't think Winnipeg has the appetite to go into a, a full-on renovation. So they're going to need quality assets coming back. Maybe you get that in a Shifley trade. You certainly are going to need it in, in, in trying to replace Pierre-Luc Dubois because, as I said you know, 30 seconds ago, he is a priority sign in Winnipeg. And if he decides he's not going to extend in Winnipeg long-term, then I find it hard to believe that the Winnipeg Jets will just simply slide him into Montreal. It won't be that easy. All right, there's uh, there's Dregs, and uh, listen, I'm I'm with um, with Dregs on that one point. Um, you know, they won't be forced just to hand Pierre Luc Dubois over to the Montreal Canadiens um, for less than you know the value that he should command on the trade market. And listen, a lot of things can happen in a year, not necessarily here in Winnipeg, but. You know, if Pierre-Luc Dubois, we've talked about this before, was traded to the Los Angeles Kings or Florida or one of these other teams and goes there and realizes, hey, this is a pretty good team and a great place to live and the money's on the table, maybe the Montreal Canadiens don't even get that opportunity. So there is some risk in allowing that situation to move on and basically just decide to tackle it in free agency. But at the same time, I, mean, I think where the Habs are right now, they really aren't in a hurry to give up the assets that the Winnipeg Jets would need to trade Pierre-Luc Dubois. And, you know, there could be some risk of uh, them waiting it out and, you know, having Dubois going somewhere else and maybe not making it to that point. The bottom line is, first things first for the Winnipeg Jets, exhaust all possibilities on signing Dubois. And if that is not happening, measure what you're able to get for him right now in the offseason or potentially wait throughout next year and, potentially wait all the way to the trade deadline to try to get max value for an asset that they absolutely have to capitalize on if he won't be here long term. Yeah, uh, you know, oh, perfect. I was muted there. Shit. <laughs> it's just uh, you know what? Perfect. Just move on. Move on to Trevor. I, <laughs> per I'm done. Perfect I'm time. Done. Perfect time for a why not question of the day, um, and we'll put this into the chat. And certainly, if you're listening on the podcast, you're gonna have to uh, you know hit us up on Twitter maybe with some feedback from uh, from it. Um, what do you think it would take? to keep Pierre-Luc Dubois in Winnipeg? Or are you of the opinion, and I know there's many of you out there, that that ship has sailed, the uh, the egg timer has been turned around, and there is a finite time of one more season, max, that Pierre-Luc Dubois can be a Winnipeg Jet. Hit us up in the comments of the YouTube channel or in the chat right now or on Twitter. 
course, our why not question of the day brought to you by the gang down at Not Auto Corp at Waverly and McGilvery. All right. We are going to connect with Trevor Kidd and get his thoughts on everything going on around this hockey team as the team comes back and gets ready to start this five game homestand against the Detroit Red Wings tomorrow. Before we do that, got to thank our friends over at Manitoba Battery for their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Gang, if you're in need of a battery for your car, your truck, or even that summer toy you're working on while we wait for this snow to melt, Manitoba Battery wants you to know that they're the most convenient and well-priced option in the city. It's going to save you time and money. Gang, you can put your order in for a battery by calling or online at manitobabattery.com at lunchtime today or right around now at the start of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And Manitoba Battery will have that on your doorstep in two to four hours for less money than you'd pay anywhere else in the city. That's right. No more waiting for a parking spot at Costco or standing in a line at Canadian Tire or really spending money at those big box stores. You can shop local, save money, and get the best service in town from Donnie and the gang over at Manitoba Battery. Give them a phone call, 783-8787, or check them out online at manitobabattery.com where you can order as well. Let them bring it to you, and you can focus on more important things. Of course, Manitoba Battery, the king of all things batteries, 1026 Logan Avenue as well. If you want to pop in and see Donnie and the gang in person, a uh, big shout out to our friends at Consolidated Supply. Uh, like everyone else, we're waiting for this snow to melt. But when it does, golf season's on and Consolidated Supply for years has been the leader in irrigation products and solutions for golf courses around the province. But they can also do it for you on your property. If you have irrigation needs, Talk to Joe and Spicy and Gang about what they can do for you. And heck, if you've got any interest in artificial turf, maybe you want to put that dream putting green in the backyard, they can help you with that as well. And while you're thinking about adding to the backyard, check out their great selection of hot tubs as well as amazing outdoor kitchen options all down at the showroom at 1395 Niaqua Road East. You can also find out what Consolidated Supply has going on on their fully revamped website online at cte.ca. Um, I should remind you folks, a couple days left in March, last call for nominees for the Unsung Hero with our friends at Wallace & Wallace. Tell us about that person in your community, your life, that you know, is helping others by dedicating their time and free time outside of work to volunteering, charity work, or maybe being that go-to person that is always one helping out a neighbor in need. Tell us about it and them by sending us an email to unsunghero at winnipegsportstalk.com. March Unsung Hero will get an autographed jersey from Jets All-Star defenseman Josh Morrissey. Wallace and Wallace will make a $500 donation to the Dream Factory in the name of the Winnipeg Sports Talk listener who nominated the Unsung Hero. And Josh and Margot Morrissey will match that as well. So get those nominations in before the end of March by emailing us, unsunghero at winnipegsportstalk.com. And if you're looking for great prices, gang, on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, you need to get down to one of seven Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. Uh, with spring right around the corner, you need to get ready for it with Ultimate Male Energy, formulated specifically for men over 35. Ultimate Male Energy is designed to help improve testosterone production, reduce excess body fat, build muscle tissue, maintain prostate health, and more. It's on sale today at Vita Health. And hey, if you can't make it down to any of the seven Vita Health stores, visit their website to buy on online. Local delivery is now available at Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge, and online at myvita.ca. All right, Brandon Rewicki still to come. We will talk Jays before first pitch on opening day this afternoon. Right now, though, let's welcome in former NHLer and NHL analyst Trevor Kidd to Winnipeg Sports Talk. Kidder, great to have you on the program. How are you doing, man? Not too bad. Yourself? Well, I'm feeling a little bit better than I was yesterday, but I'll be honest, like a lot of Jet fans, I was pretty much nuclear when we got into the show yesterday. And uh, oh, I got to say, I really enjoy the post-game show with uh, you on with uh, Kelly and Christian on OB after the game on Tuesday. I mean... We had lots to talk about. Well, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, what? How, how are we here? Um, 
it, it's just truly incredible. I mean, when you think about this team that was first place in the Western Conference, like just over two months ago, that was on the verge of missing the playoffs. But in a lot of ways, it seemed like that game on Tuesday night against the Sharks kind of was a perfect example of so many things that have gone wrong for the Winnipeg Jets. Before we talk about the big picture, I mean, what did you think about the shutout loss to San Jose, considering what was on the line for the Winnipeg Jets? Yeah, you know what? Um, the inconsistencies that we've seen here since mid-January, uh, I mean, now we've been talking about it locally here for probably the last month or so. Um, but it's interesting now that uh, this this team in this situation and uh, the items that uh, are pretty familiar to, to Jet fans and the local scene now is being spoken about, uh, you know, even when you tune in from a national perspective, watching Sportsnet, watching TSN, uh, the Winnipeg Jets are, are, are front page news for the wrong reasons. And you can point at a lot of different things, um, but it's, to me, you know, the game specifically, there, there again, it's where, where do you want to break this down? It, there's, there's so many different things to look at, Huss. Uh, you know, from an offensive perspective, you could say that, you know, the Winnipeg Jets, they fired 40 shots, over 40 shots at James Reimer. Um, and, and there's this argument about the quality versus quantity, and you saw uh, that play out post game. But, you know, to me, there was a little bit of both uh, when you talk about the offensive uh, part of that game against San Jose, that, yeah, there was a, a quantity there. And certainly, I think a team that's a little bit snake bitten on the offensive side, uh, to me, you want to put more pucks in it. Yes, there's a whole thing about missing the net and, uh, and there's the cons- uh, constant uh, the challenges in regards to uh, who's in front of that one thing to throw pucks at the net from distance or from the perimeter. But if you don't have anyone in front of the net, not much is going to happen with goaltending being what it is this, uh, these days. However, there were some, you think about some of the opportunities. Uh, there was a couple that were high danger opportunities that uh, the Winnipeg Jets had where James Reimer had to be out of this world. I mean, think of the paddle save on Appleton uh, in the second period. So there was quantity. Uh, there was, to me, some quality in that game. I would say there was enough quality uh, to win that hockey game. However, when you start looking at some of the things that happened defensively, um, you start looking again at the guys, the power play, Huss, the power play is that could save the bacon here with so many different things. I mean, we could talk about the power play here for uh, till the cows come home. I mean, that power play whether it be gaining the zone one thing, once they do get the zone, uh, the perimeter play is, it, 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 it's, they just can't seem to get the seam pass. Uh, and it worked five years ago. It worked four years ago. They can't get the seam pass out of their system. And, uh, you know, the first power, you think of the power plays that they had, they had two in the third period to take over that game. The first one, they had no shots. The second one, they had two shots, us, and you recall where they came from. It was Kyle Connor on the left side, uh, and his butt was on the board side hashes when he took those two shots. And as he's taking them, I'm like, well, why are you taking that shot? There's no one in front of the net, and I, I don't care. Ovechkin is not scoring from the board side hashes with a goaltender already squared up to that play. Yeah, but that to me is some of the struggles that you see on the power play, whether it be the shots, whether it be the lack of traffic, whether it be the perimeter type play. Uh, but to me, again, the big thing and why we're talking what we're talking, I think the, the one, uh, when you look at the second goal that happened in that San Jose game where uh, turnovers have been a big issue, but you know who's turning the puck over and where they're turning it over, uh, number 55, turning the puck over uh, basically on the right side circle and what happened after that um, with that play going from the right side circle over to the left side circle uh, that puck going to the net ultimately finding uh, the back of the net on Connor Hellebuck 55 had a hand on that player and the lackadaisical again we're talking motivation effort however many different words you want to look at in, in that category, uh, desperation, urgency, 
uh, in a game that is a must need. Uh, and one of your players, your top players, a player that wears a letter uh, from a captaincy perspective on the jersey, that is frustrating. That is frustrating to the group, the core, the players wise. And certainly you're seeing it now being played out by uh, the head coach. Uh, so, you know, again, that's uh, to me when you know, the, the, this this culture thing and the band aid was was certainly ripped off of. You know, how did we get to this point? We got to this point years ago. You could, last year, they obviously it was an issue. You went through two coaches last year. It was somewhat temporarily fixed by tearing the C off of Blake Wheeler. Uh, and we could talk about that because I don't, you know, of all the things that we're talking about here, Haas, with, you know, 55 in the leadership, to some, and it's the two sides of the coin. Blake Wheeler, to me, has been pretty immune to a lot of what's been going on here and pointing fingers for the last two months, certainly the last two weeks. And, but with that being said, the, the, the letter was torn off his jersey and, if you're saying that I'm not a leader and you don't want me to step up and you want me to fade into the woodwork, then the other side of the coin is, well, why, why would Blake Wheeler do anything? Why would he say anything? Why? So it's, it's a bit of a nightmare because of what yeah. he makes specifically and, and thinking that he's got another year at 8 million bucks. Right. So back to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I well, can keep listen, going here. I, this is I, craziness. I, you know, exactly. I mean, there's so many angles to this. And, I mean, part of it is the big picture. Part of it is the just the here and now with seven games left in the season and the situation that they put themselves in. But, I mean, it, I mean you nail, nailed it. Um, coming out of that game, I mean, there were, I mean, there's been huge questions about how committed Mark Scheifele is to his team, his teammates right now, and what he's putting forth. And, I mean, if there was any question that things are – not right right now with that player, with his team, and with his coach. We heard it afterwards. Um, I mean, it heard it, it, it heard it, and the body language, right, Huss? I mean, well, the eyeball rolling there, is something. Well, well that, listen, uh, I mean, we'll get to bones in a minute, but I mean, I just wanted to know, like, when you guys were there doing the post game, and you heard Mark Shifley, and I mean, credit to Marat for asking this question and then putting it out. I mean, he basically said that. Listen, we know what the coaches are saying, but. I like to do things a different way. And he continues to walk to the beat of his own drummer. I mean, we've heard a lot about the Adam Oates uh, influence and all that. It's almost like, hey, well, my coach is telling me something else and this is what I'm doing. And I can't imagine how destructive that is in a team environment for someone that is so important to a hockey team. Yeah, I mean, I made references and it's it's unusual. Um you know, I think of the captains, and again, I know there's three guys. Lowry has an A, Shifley has an A, Morrissey has an A. Uh, if, if you take away Josh's 44's season and just say he was having a, you know, a regular uh, production type year uh, for a defenseman on this hockey club, Mark Shifley, 55, has been here the longest. I, he would be the um, captain, in my opinion. He, he would be the guy that would answer the bell for the group from an accountability perspective. And to me, he's, it, I haven't seen him do, do that to this point. And I think that's some of the frustration. And again, my comparison said, I said that to, I know the game is different now and, and, and even how this is being played out now in the public from a coaching perspective, uh, uh, you know, I had Matt Sundin in Toronto, Ronnie Francis in Carolina, Scott Mellenby in in Florida, uh, Joe Newendike, Gary Roberts. Like I saw these guys after each and every game be held accountable to not only themselves but the group. Period. Each and every game, these guys had to stand up to the media and be held accountable for whatever happened, good, bad, or otherwise. And I know the game has changed in that regard, but. Again, some of the the frustrations internally uh, and and externally is, and you mentioned it, beat to, to a different uh, uh, drum. The fifty five uh, doesn't seem to or is on a different page than either what we're seeing, what we're watching with our own eyes, or certainly what the coach has been. 
uh, you know, now being very open and very transparent with, which again is so that part alone is, is just on a one-off, like you, you've, the amount of conversations, Huss, that would have happened in, go back two weeks ago when you talked about the motivation thing with Scott yeah. Billet, right? The amount of, the, and we're talking a mountain of conversations internally with your coaching staff and how are we trying to, is he, you know, Bones always says that whatever the media is hearing, whatever the public is hearing, that room has already heard that. Oh, and, and I bet they've been hearing it for a while. Well, no, this is what I'm saying. So the mountain of conversations mm-hmm. that have happened internally, it has to be off the radar screen. Now, where I've said this in the postgame show, what what has been spoken about now is is the leadership of this group. No matter what happens now, uh, it, 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 to say that Kevin Sheveldayoff hasn't been briefed on what's going to, Mark Chipman hasn't been briefed, uh, on, on what the internal component of this hockey club is now, because this changes everything from an organizational point of view, period. And we can have a conversation about the product is stale and there needs to be changes and we're, you know, 12 years and everything else. Season ticket holders, you know, wanting to see something different. That's one thing. But if you have a hockey club and you have a core group that is not motivated that seems to be not trying, uh, doesn't want to play with urgency, that's a different thing. And if you lose that fan because of those reasons, getting them back into the building is a lot more challenging. This is why I'm saying what's going on here is so much bigger than just that 60 minutes on the ice. No, you're you're exactly right, Trevor. And I mean, and it's sort of in a lot of ways come to a, come to a head and, Listen, I mean, a lot of the, I would say, I mean, the uh, culpability here is on the organization and the general manager for mm-hmm. continuing to come back to this when evidence was very clear that probably this needed to be shaken up or major changes needed to be made far before this year. And listen, it speaks to the job that Rick Bonus has done this season. The fact that this team True. was in first place in the Western Conference, they somehow managed to get past that. You know, the change of the captaincy, the pledge amongst the players, the accountability that mm-hmm. that we basically saw for the better part of the first half of the season, but for it to all come crashing down in the spectacular fashion that it has, um, I mean, there could be no more five alarm blaze. I'm sure inside those management <laughs> offices when it comes to what happens going forward. But before we even get to that point, and I don't think there's much dispute that you know there needs to be massive massive surgery to this hockey club moving forward and some major major changes involving some of the most important players but as far as right now trevor i mean as bad as this last couple months has been they earned a spot high enough in the playoffs that they've been one of the worst teams in the league for two months and they're still in a playoff spot and there's a five game homestand beginning tomorrow and a lot of noise around this team and i I, it is going to be fascinating to see how this team comes back, who steps up. Uh, the problem is, though, and it, this in a lot of ways comes back to Mark Shifley, um, there's only so many things you can do. When, when you have a player that is invested with so much trust and so much importance to a hockey club, if people aren't all in on the same page, it's just simply not going to work. And we've seen that over and over and over again lately with the team that has been one of the better goal-scoring teams in the league with absolutely no answers for teams like the San Jose Sharks. But Trev, from Rick Bonus's standpoint, um, and and I don't even know where to go with this one because, I mean, we heard from Bones. We've heard a number of times. We've seen what he's done with the the, the benching in Carolina, what he said afterwards, the questions about the motivation, and that's Mm -hmm. what we're dealing with. And then, I mean, I don't know, the eye roll heard around the National Hockey League on Tuesday <laughs> night after he was basically informed that Mark Shifley had gone up and said, well, you know, I know they're talking about getting pucks on net and working hard around there, but he more likes to control. I mean, I, I, I took that as in some ways a public slap in the face or a clap back to Rick Bonus that had been very clear in challenging one of his assistant captains to be better. Um like disappointment the, the, it was a huge the, oh. the eyeball roll was the level of disappointment in hearing that again think about i go back to the mountains of conversations 
that have to be happening inside that locker room, whether it be the group, the guys themselves, or certainly the interaction with coaches. This day and age, coaches will do nearly everything. I mean, I would say Paul Maurice threw the white towel in and, and walked away before he would throw one of his players under the bus. Um, we saw, uh, you know, Lowry come in and, and obviously, you know, so we're on the third coach now uh, in the last uh, uh, two years. And again, a coach does not want to go public with what's happening right now. That is the last, the last, the last part because it can, it, it tears things up. And we're, we're seeing, seeing it now, but the frustration that has to be had the disappointment in, in what you saw there in the eyeball role. Um, that, yeah, I, I mean, what's happening today, even this morning as we speak with morning skate, uh, uh, the media scrums that'll be happening afterwards. You're right. I mean, the Winnipeg Jets put themselves in such a, a good position with how they played to start the year that if you can believe it, they're still holding a playoff position. And he said, you know, again, to, to bonuses credit, uh, this is on this is on that team. This is on those guys. This is on the individual, uh, the pride thing. I mean, when was the last time you heard a coach in any sport saying? But yeah, Trev. I mean, to have to play the pride card to a hockey club in the situation that they're in is, oh, I mean, man. I think outside the realm of possibility to most people. But that honestly seems like with a certain part of this hockey club, starting with the guy we've been talking about, is where it started and. Listen, I think it's got to be really tough for the other players in that locker room. I mean, they're seeing what's transpiring around them. They're seeing their season evaporate in front of their eyes. And, I mean, in other situations, you'd look to play other players. You'd look to maybe do some different things. Maybe, I mean, as crazy as this sounds, I mean, who would have thought it? But put a guy in the press box for a bit. But, I mean, (laughs) we're talking about seven games left in the year at a time when, I mean, realistically, the way this team is made up, I mean, this team is not doing anything if they don't get contributions, positive contributions from guys near the top of the lineup. And, I mean, it, it is one of the most unfortunate and has to be difficult situations that a guy like Rick Bonus has seen, and this guy has more experience than anybody in the National Hockey I know. League, Trev. I know. I mean, what is left to do? I mean, you've called out your team. You've been comp- You've torn the Band-Aid off. And what we've seen here for a couple of years, completely torn it off. And, and now the, 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 the transparency into that locker room is, is ugly. Uh, the toxicity of it is, is obviously at a high level. Uh, and it is centered around, I mean, to me, you were talking about 55, but I don't think you can say number 55 without number 26 being somewhere in that conversation. Uh, going back to, you know, last year, the captaincy being taken away. And, um, you know, your former captain, how long is, was he the captain here, Huss? Uh, six, seven years. Um, he is He's pretty much a mute point here, which is uh, unfortunate in the situation because he, he is a leader, um, has always been, but is somewhat, again, immune to this situation. Uh, the... The eggshell, no, and what I'm curious, I mean, we can talk about what's been said, you know, just, you know, going forward, once, you know, yesterday morning, um, this team would have, you know, getting onto that airplane in San Jose to travel yesterday, uh, you know, that would have been interesting in itself. So you have, you know, three teams that wake up, one dealing the Winnipeg Jets with, you know, a, a team that is not playing with pride, and you have the Nashville Predators and the Calgary Flames, uh uh, waking up, uh, knocking on the door. I mean, the, the the spring in the step for the Predators and the Flames over the last 24, 48 hours is is high level. Now, what's that step look like for the Winnipeg Jets? Is it walking on eggshells? I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> it, it the, the inside of that room has to be to be a fly in the wall, right? And. The frustration from other players, too, the one last thing to wrap it up, you mentioned, you know, again, I've talked about 55, 26, but, I mean, you've seen us in the building. You go to the hockey games. The the amount of slamming of gates and doors in a hockey game, I mean, it's amazing that the two entrances to the box on the Winnipeg Jets bench uh, still operate. 
Uh, All star maintenance times. guys down at Canada Life Center. Uh, honestly, I mean, it's a few times I thought that the door is going to end up at center ice where the way they, you know, slamming it shut. Like, this is happening at different points. I mean, and we've heard players being caught on mic uh, in, in the television broadcasts expressing frustrations, whether it be to the ref, whether it be to, you know, other players. So, it, how did they, how they bring all of this together to play as a unit, to play as a collective? When you're talking about work ethic, you're talking about urgency, you're talking about uh, effort. It, it, it this is how this gets played out in the next uh, two weeks, uh, seven games is and and again it doesn't end here. You know, it'll be it, it might salvage a few things. But I don't think it's going to change. And that's why I say what's happening right now is a little bit bigger than seven games in, in 60 oh. minutes. Uh, what happens this summer is is not going to be, in my opinion, insignificant. No, this is just, I mean, what happened on Tuesday night, I think in a lot of ways, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And we've right. been seeing it exposed underneath the water, not just in the past two weeks or the past two months, but really the past mm-hmm. few years. But back to right now, Trevor, considering everything that's happened, um, I mean, you've been in these rooms before, seen ups and downs. I mean, maybe nothing like this before, but put yourself in the position of Josh Morrissey and Adam Lowry, the two guys that really have been leading the way, that have stepped up, that have done, I think, everything that the coaching staff has asked of them this year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, knowing that those guys are part of this leadership group as well, and really, I think the guys that most of the team is looking to um, – how do you handle this right now within that group because of obviously what we're seeing play out right in front of our eyes, but knowing the urgency and the desperation needed that they have not, like they're still in this, but I mean, I just wonder how they can go in and try and lead the guys that are in. And um, if that's even good enough, considering what they need to do in the next five games at home. Well, I mean, again, we're, we're talking about adults here. And, and and professionals that are getting paid, you know, big bucks. And what that situation is no different than any other environment uh, in everyday life that has a, you know, a team. If you're not self-employed working for yourself, then you're usually within a team and you, you have to toe in the right direction. You want to be successful. You got to do a lot of things in, in the same direction, right? And a lot of that is just leading by example if you're the leader in, within that team. And uh, to me, that is the simplest thing to do. You can't... <laughs> At, at this point, uh, in you know, in reference to the players that we're talking about, uh, you can only lead that horse to the trough. You can't let you know. You can't force them to drink the water. So, with that being said, you you have to do what you can, and what you can is is leading by example, uh, and and that's all you can do, right? And if there are some individuals that are not willing to partake, then you know, as we've spoken about, the organization will have to address that at some point. Because clearly you've seen uh, the coach's struggles in regarding to, you know, getting players to buy in and getting certain players to partake in regards to the culture and what's needed at this point in time. Uh, as it pertains to what you just mentioned, the Josh Morrissey and, and Dave, uh, uh, Adam Lowry. Uh, Adam Lowry specifically in the last couple of weeks. I mean, you talk about, about a guy with a letter on his uh, jersey um, leading by example, uh, Adam Lowry has done real, real well. Like you think, again, some of the things I'm talking about, getting in front of the goaltender, uh, uh, playing, getting into the hard parts of the ice, playing uh, in, in front of that blue paint, uh, driving the net, uh, working hard along Everything the boards, the battles. Preaching. All of that stuff, Huss, is has been Adam Lowry here in the last two to three weeks. And if you're Adam Lowry, that's all you can do. That What else can be expected of you than going out there and laying it all on the line. And it's no different for Josh Morrissey. It's no different for some of the other leadership, you know, players on that hockey team. But, you know, again, a part of the problem is you're not talking about the fourth and third line here in regards to, you know, the players that we're talking about. These are your difference makers that you're having to say, you know, motivation, pride, work ethic, effort, all those sorts of things. Uh, and that's why the struggles are there. Well, and, and one other thing that I mean, we have to talk to you about, and I mean, listen, I understand that Rick Bonus is struggling with a lot of internal challenges right now um, and is doing what he can try to do to give his team the best chance to win. 
Uh, the one I think that most observers would agree. I mean, a guy that is showing hard, is showing some passion, has been the one guy that if the top six has been somewhat productive for the last couple of weeks is Nikolai Ehlers. And yet we're seeing him play less than a player like Blake Wheeler at times. I mean, the one thing I'll say for bonus, I mean, I think the time has long since passed to just figure out the guys that want it, the guys that are doing their best to get out there. And a player like Ehlers, which, you know, by shift is so productive, get him out on the ice a little bit more. Well, what, what was it, a week and a half ago uh, when they were in St. Louis, Huss? And Nick Ehlers uh, dropped the gloves with uh, Shen. Exactly. And he was he was lucky he didn't get knocked into the middle of next year. Uh, that was yeah. a, that was a, not a fight that Nick Ehlers should have uh, taken. But again, a, a guy wanting to lead by example, want to get his group going, want to show the passion, want to show the enthusiasm, the want, the, you know, the, the give a hoot factor meter uh, is there. And I don't disagree with you with Nick Ehlers, uh, but coach is trying so many different things to get these lines going, to get production going. And, you know, Nick Ehlers uh, in, in the last game, maybe that was the easy move and, and, and bumping him down. What is the next move, though, when you start talking about, you know, juggling players around? You mentioned a healthy scratch. Well, you're not going to, you know, put Blake Wheeler in the press box. You're not going to put Shifley in the, in, in, in the press box. And, you know, Kyle Connor certainly not going there. I mean, to me, potentially the next move would be Blake Wheeler going down to the third line uh, as as an option. But uh, it, it, uh, the, the lineup is what it is. I don't think you're going to see unless Cole Perfetti decides to come back here in the next, uh, you know, few games. And we know we, we know that's not going to happen. The juggling uh, in trying to find something to click, something to work, uh, it might be a struggle. It might be right to the end of the year. I uh, certainly, you know, coach, I, I, I'm hoping, and certainly you're seeing the move there with Nick Ehlers. And if one guy is, you know, yeah, he's probably frustrated to make the move, but, you know, knowing what we know about Nick Ehlers is that he would make that move for the betterment of, of the team. If it, if it worked, if it made things uh, better, uh, then, then he is a team type guy. And what we know uh, that would be acceptable uh, of that move, uh, albeit not happy and having less minutes. Yeah, and, and you know, just back to that St. Louis game. I mean, that was one of the things that was so disappointing about that third period. After Ehlers, you know, put himself mm -hmm. on the line, took a you know a bunch of shots to the head. I mean, there was really no response from the club, and um, we're gonna find out what response we get from the Winnipeg Jets to start this road trip tomorrow night against the Detroit Red Wings. It is going to be fascinating, and uh, we'll buckle up and see what happens. But the the real interesting <laughs> stuff is coming at the end of whether it's game eighty two or end of the playoff run for the Winnipeg Jets is when the, the rubber's really going to hit the road. Trevor, thanks so much for doing this, man. It's always great to have you on the program. Have an awesome next few days and the weekend, and uh, hopefully we can do this again real soon. Great stuff. For sure, Russ. Yeah, thanks for the convo, man. Appreciate it. All right, great stuff with Kidder. Really appreciate him joining us today on the program. Um, we're going to stick with the Jets. Rowicki's on deck, and we do have Rick Bonus. From earlier today, uh, once we're finished talking with Brandon, we'll get to that uh, coming up before we talk a little baseball with J.D. Bunkus and Blue Jays opening day. By the way, speaking of opening day, our pal Greg down at Royal Sports just let us know they got a ton of Blue Jays gear in today, just in time for first pitch this afternoon. So you Jays fans that want to uh, up the kit heading into the first of 162 games. Get on down. They're all on the shelves right now. Men's and women's jerseys, T-shirts, hoodies, tons of hats. Um, and maybe if you're a fan of some of the other teams, they're receiving Yankee stuff, Shohei Otani, and the rest of the teams right now. It's all going to be out on the shelves later today or tomorrow. Royal Sports, the number one spot for fan gear anywhere. Get on down there and get ready for opening day. While you're at it, you can check out all the great NHL merch, NFL, Major League Baseball, as we just mentioned, um, Raptors, NBA, international soccer. And, uh, hey, spring is here as well. Or, well, it hopefully will be here soon. Soccer, baseball, softball gear. Bikes coming in as well. Get ready for uh, the turn of the season and baseball season down at Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. And make sure to give them a follow on uh, Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. Um, fellas, how's the wardrobe 
looking into spring and summer. If you need to up your menswear game, only one place to go, and that's F Apparel down at 190 Smith Street. Let Andrew and his great staff size you up and get custom made to fit men's clothing. They'll make you look better than ever before. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, uh, and all sorts of other great custom gear, including men's golf pants, cargos, chinos, as well as custom shirts to be worn both tucked and untucked, along with the best selection of men's accessories around. If you're in a wedding party this summer, talk to them about a 15% discount for the entire wedding party at F Apparel. And if you have a 2023 high school grad in the family, get the young man a new suit to transition into the next stage of life. And F Apparel will uh, add in a free custom shirt and tie valued at $150 for 2023 high school grads. It's all waiting for you at F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown. Find out more or make an appointment online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. And uh, hey, just before we bring in Brandon, it is opening day. Big slate of games in the National Hockey League. Might be a good day to... Maybe hook up with the gang down at Boston Pizza. Watch the Blue Jays and some hockey tonight. No better place to gather with friends to watch the big game on the big screen than your local BP. And while you're there, you can enjoy ice-cold schooners, world's famous Boston wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. And, of course, if you are staying home but want the great taste of BP, you can always order online at bostonpizza.com. All right, we will have Rick bonus comments from today coming up in a few minutes. But let's welcome in the host of Skates and Plates, our guy, Brandon Rowicki, who I'm sure, uh, like us, has had lots to talk about lately. Not a lot of positives, though, around the Winnipeg Jets. They uh, maintain their spot two points up with seven games left in the season, heading into the Detroit Red Wings visit tomorrow at Canada Life Center. Rue, what's going on? Oh, I'm doing all right. How are we doing? Well, I've calmed down from yesterday. Anyone that watched <laughs> the beginning of the show knows that I was somewhat nuclear, like... Most of the Winnipeg Jets fan base um, calmed down a little bit, but the situation around the team really hasn't. Um, I, I've got to ask you, I mean, we've spent you know a number of uh, your visits on the program talking about the slide of this hockey club over the last couple months to a very, very critical point in the season that could see them fall out of a playoff spot in the next few games if they do not get it together and start putting up some wins. But it really did seem like that loss in San Jose, being shut out again against the worst team in the National Hockey League, it it felt like somewhat of a rock bottom on the ice. But I think what really got people talking was what we heard afterwards from Mark Shifley and then an exasperated Rick Bonus. Uh, it, it really was something, wasn't it? What, what did you think about the game and then what we heard afterwards? You know, it's it's funny because if you if you ignore the way the Jets have played for for the last three months, which is hard to do, but if you just look at it like from a single game basis, they didn't play terrible. Like James Reimer made what like three or four highlight level saves. Um, again, finishing is just it, it's this team's Achilles heel. They they can't score if their lives depended on it. But they, it wasn't their worst game of the season compared to some of the other duds they've thrown out there over the last little while. It's just that any half decent team would go into to San Jose and beat the brains out of the sharks, right? Like you just doesn't no excuses. If you have intentions of being somewhat of a, a noisemaker come playoff time, you, you take care of business against the sharks because they've lost to everybody, not named the Winnipeg jets over the last 14, 15, 16 games. Um, so, so there, there's that aspect of it, but that to me is kind of, um, it, it really isn't all that interesting. It, it was the, the eye roll, heard or seen around the world right like that 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 to me is the that's all we should be talking about from from that game the game itself is what we've seen these jets do for quite some time now so there's not really anything earth shattering that that came out of that it's the fact that the coach wants this team's star player to play a certain way and the star player doesn't want to doesn't doesn't feel like it like that 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 to me is the main sound familiar yeah, exactly. what, what what's Dave Lowry thinking when yeah. he sees this going on right now? Yeah, Dave, Dave Lowry's probably feeling pretty good about himself, and I'm sure Paul Maurice. Well, he's got his own problems out there in Florida, but there's probably a little bit of yeah, I, I told you so too, right? Like that that to me was was the signature moment of the season. I think like that that describes 
that might be if you were to just try and describe the Winnipeg Jets without using a word, an eye roll might be the perfect way to go about it. So, so that that to me was the symbolizing of of how this team has crashed and burned since the start of the new year, I guess. Right, and I I, I think you know you mentioned being angry and and things like that, and you know personally, like I I just think I'm past that point, right? Like that that the angry point was maybe a month ago. Now it's like th- there's almost a level of shock and like how, how low can this actually go? But it's I've just come to the conclusion of the realization that the Winnipeg Jets, as we know it, are, are dead, done and dusted. Like no, w- whether it's the next seven games of the regular season or four or five more in the in the postseason. I, I even think if they win a couple rounds, th- this group is never coming back ever again. Um, so however you feel about the team, whether that's good or bad news. Um, you know, you can watch these next handful of games knowing that this group clearly cannot come back and complete another season here in Winnipeg for, for so many different reasons. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it um, – and again, we've been talking about this for a while that, I mean, predating this season even. I mean, last year, last year, like early on in the year about, you know, a change to the core. And, hey, listen, they made a calculated risk by not changing things with the exception of a coach. and. Hey, listen, I mean, we all, I was at the front of the line, I mean, 40, 45 games in, talking about what a brilliant move it was and look at the results that they'd had. But that has just made what's happened in the last few months, I mean, that much more stunning, I think, to everyone that has seen this team play at such a higher level than what they're doing right now consistently. And obviously the conversations continue to come back to the top players of the club. And Mark Shifley was the one in the crosshairs yesterday. I mean, listen, of his own doing, he hasn't been playing well at all, hasn't been buying into the system. But the fact that he went in and almost publicly just refuted everything that we've been hearing from the coaches and then what a lot of his teammates are buying in and his comments compared to what Dylan DeMello said seconds later um, were diametrically opposed. And, I mean, that puts a coach in a very, very difficult situation. So moving into right now, and we'll talk about kind of moves and the the big picture beyond the next couple weeks in a minute. Um, But Mark Scheifele has been moved off of center, and he's playing now, or looks to be playing tomorrow night, on the wing with Dubois and Kyle Connor. Um, It's an interesting way of changing things around. I mean, there's no way you can throw a guy like that up in the press box. I mean, it's just too important, and... He's too important to the club right now, even with what he is and isn't doing right now. What do you make of Bones' move um, to move Scheif to the wing and put him alongside in what is certainly offensively a loaded top line with Dubois and Connor? Yeah, I mean, it, it is funny. If, if John Tortorella was coaching the Winnipeg Jets, you bet your ass Mark Scheife would be in the press. He, he would have been in the press box already, but you'd, I, I don't know. I I kind of disagree with that. Like I, To, to me, this is almost another half measure by the Jets. Like you, you, you publicly come out and, and to, to have the, the coach make the reaction that he did. And it wasn't like Shifley went out and says, ah, the coach is stupid. I'm not doing what he, it wasn't anything like that, but I, I don't know, like desperate times kind of call for desperate measures here. And you want to send a message to get this team playing the right way. Is there a bigger message out there right now than, Sitting, you're maybe your biggest star player, face of the, whatever you want to call him, ha- having Mark Shifley sit a game out there and then see what the response from the rest of the team is going to be. I, 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 I don't think it's as outlandish as as some might think. There. Um, having said that, though, with the move out there to the wing, I, I would say this might be something that was long overdue as well, where you you limit the defensive responsibility of Mark Shifley and again turn over there on one of the San Jose Shark schools. In the uh, late in the game there out in California, so um, I'm I don't know I, I I'm okay with some of it. It's it's kind of like I'm kind of on the fence. Like it's it's good that I think that it, it's somewhat of a demotion for Shifley. Um, having said that though, I still think for whatever reason this coaching staff is doing whatever it takes to not play their best line, right? Like they're they're doing everything but what seems to be the simplest solution here in putting Dubois, Connor, and Ehlers together as a line. And then having Shifley be your, your your second line center or second line wing, whatever it is there. And then on top of that, I don't know if I don't know if Blake Wheeler has a stipulation in his contract that he's in the top six no matter what. But that again seems to be one of the easiest moves here, where lessen the load on the guy that's 35, 36 and give him 13 minutes a night and have him play out there on the third line because he's 
at, at least he has the excuse of, you know, being in his mid to late thirties. I'll, I'll, I'll cut him a bit of a break there being in my like early to mid thirties. It's, it's tough getting up the stairs, let alone playing 19 minutes a night, you know, four or five times a week, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll even cut Wheeler a bit of slack there. But it's anybody that's watching the games can see he's 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 ineffective out there. Like he just he's he's lost his fastball, and I I think those two moves there seem to be the easiest ones. Yet it's for whatever reason the ones that the coaching staff is completely shying away from putting those into motion whatsoever. Yeah, uh, listen, it is puzzling. I, I'm not going to disagree with you on that one. I mean, it's clear that, and again, I had a lot of um, compliments for Blake with the way that he handled losing the C at the beginning of the season, the way that he played for the first half of the year. And I really do see a completely different player that's come back after that very painful injury that happened before. And I mean, I'm not sure whether there's something that's still bothering him, but, you know, whether we're just seeing the law of diminishing returns right in front of our eyes for a guy that had a good start to the season, far beyond, I think, what most people's expectations were, that is now playing below those. The bottom line is right now, this is a results business. They're getting no results right now. It's been 21 games without a goal. And even the goal scoring maybe is not a, as big of an issue with Wheeler because he's more of a setup man. But the line that he has been on, along with Mark Shifley, more often than not, have been completely ineffective. I mean, they haven't been doing any of the things that the coaching staff continues to hammer on. And I think we found out a lot why. Of course, when we heard from Shifley uh, earlier, or earlier, well, later after the uh, the game on Tuesday night. All that being said, Brando, um, you know the future of Shifley and Wheeler, I think, is very much up in the air, or some would say almost a fait accompli. But right now, this season is not lost, despite the way a lot of people are feeling, um, and they have to figure out some way to get things going. And I am with you. I mean, I think that a lesser load playing with different players, I think, could be very beneficial for Wheeler. And I mean, I think it's also an opportunity to whether you're putting Nino Niederreiter up, who's skating with Adam Lowry today, or potentially a guy like Morgan Barron that, for my money, for shift for shift, has been one of the better Jet players for a long time and is sort of mired getting very, very minimal opportunities playing on that fourth line. Um but it does does speak to the urgency of the situation right now. And I'm not sure how many, and we're going to hear from Rick Bonus in a few minutes, how many real answers that he has. I mean, he's gotten some answers from his hockey club over the next, last little while. But to avoid one of the most, um, the biggest collapses in recent NHL history from a team that was first place in the conference in the middle of January to nine or ten weeks later being potentially out of the playoffs is uh something that I don't think anybody saw and they are grasping for some answers right now. And uh, I guess you have to try something. Um, I don't think there would have been a lot of people that would disagree if a player like 55 was maybe sat out for a game. The problem is though, you can't really see this team winning or doing anything without getting a better version of Mark Shifley. And unfortunately with what we've seen since that line was benched for just 12 minutes in that Carolina game, uh, it is it is blown up in their faces. I mean, this is not a guy that has reacted well yeah. to that sort of a challenge. And uh, that's a big reason why we are where we are and we're talking about what we're talking about. Yeah, and that that's another damning indictment, right? When you go the step just below a full-on scratch and we've seen a complete just you know, degradation of his entire hockey game and 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 kind of coming to a head out there in San Jose. I mean, it, it's, it is this perfect storm of, the players just aren't performing anywhere near their capabilities or what's the bare minimum being asked of them. And then the coaching staff, I think, just doesn't have any answers either. So you, so you have everybody essentially with the organization right now, like, I don't know how we fix this. And and the Jets can really thank the Calgary Flames for holding down a playoff spot right now because any in any normal year, any half-decent team would have blown four or five points clear of Winnipeg right now and – you know, pretty much made this a, a moot discussion going through the the final seven games, right? So, I, I don't even, I, I can't even say we'll see what they're made of. Like I, I heard Rick Bonus again mention this after the Sharks game. You know, we'll we'll see what this team is made of. We'll see how we can bounce back. We've seen that already, and we've heard it. And yeah, yeah, we've... yeah. Like I, I don't, I don't need to see or hear anything else here. We we kind of know how this goes. They they might, you know, come out against Detroit, play pretty solid, and and, and pick up a win. They they might go four and three down the stretch, and you know kick out the Calgary Flames barely, right? But 
we we kind of know what this team does the majority of the time when the going gets tough and that's they they fold up and they essentially play to their own agenda and we've seen a number of the big stars on this team do that time and time again and i think it's fair to say at this point that you me and whoever else believes in the first 44 games got completely hoodwinked and that that's the outlier when we look at the past two to three seasons of what this team does out there on the ice. Yeah, I, I, it seems like so many of the things that we expected to potentially happen last summer will finally happen this summer. I mean, mind you, I said this last year after we listened to what Shifley had to say at the end of the season, the way things went in the second half after Maurice took off. Um, and I was pretty sure that the end of the road was then, and yeah. yet they came back again. But I don't know how how they could possibly run that back again without major, major surgery to this roster. And it's starting with those two players. And then, of course, there's the Pierre-Luc Dubois situation. That's before we even get to Connor Hellebuck, who's to me in a whole other level of importance to this team and this organization. But when we talk about offense and we talk about the players up front, I mean, there is a possibility. You're basically talking about turning over the top two centers on your team on a roster that was built by general manager Kevin Sheveldayoff around having a strong center ice position. And I mean, I think these changes are necessary for a couple of reasons. Certainly the culture of the team, which we've talked about at nauseum, which has really sort of shown itself as of late. Um, but the other side of it, Brandon, is, is that when you're making moves like that, you're taking a ton of offense normally, not right now, but normally out of the lineup. Um, and you don't necessarily have those guys just to kind of fall in. And it puts a level of pressure on Shevel Day off to make these moves um, for a number of reasons. And I think the Shifley thing happens for sure in the offseason. Dubois is very interesting. And we heard Darren Drager earlier on the program saying that the Jets were planning on exhausting all opportunities to try to stay, sign Dubois. Uh, listen, they should do that. But if everything we're hearing from insiders is true, that he is basically as good as gone, it does beg the question as to when is the best time to make that move for Pierre-Luc Dubois. I was talking about this earlier on the program today. Unlike Shifley, which I think needs to be done sooner as opposed to later, the Dubois situation, you know, if they know they're going to be trading him at some point and you get a good offer in the offseason, I guess you can move on and it's probably in the best interest of this team. But I can also absolutely see a scenario where Dubois plays the first 50, 60 of the games next season and then try and capitalize on a guy who would be massively in demand at the trade deadline for a team trying to bulk and build up for a significant Stanley Cup run. If this year's deadline is any indication of what that market would be, imagine what a Dubois would get at that moment. Yeah, I know that. I, I've been thinking about that where, you know, you might, once this season is done, say, okay, these are the four guys that we want to move out in and, and start, you know, reshaping what the Winnipeg Jets are all about. But the interesting part is what you touched on there. When, when, when is that most value? Like what, when, at what point in the calendar are you able to get the biggest haul for these guys? It might be before the draft. It might be holding on to them and having them as a trade chip during the deadline. And I don't know what the right answer is for, for each of these players. If you ask me right now though, Hus. To, to me, specifically with just Shifley and Dubois, I mean, uh, even, even having the the value of the biggest chip at the deadline, culture-wise, I think Mark Shifley needs to be moved before the draft and before free agency. I There is a case for Dubois to be kept until midseason-ish around there and then figure out what the best course of action is. But the one little snag in that is that you know, especially if Montreal wants to get in on this, is they could throw out an offer sheet. And we know this is the one case where the player would be willing to sign that one. And if they throw out a cheapie for a year, and it's only like a first and a third round pick, that kind of puts the Jets in a bit of a difficult position because you would hope at least they'd be able to get more in a trade with any team out there with with, with Pierre-Luc Dubois. Yeah, you just have to match that, right? I mean, I think that's a yeah, no-brainer. You, now, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to double-check that. The only potential thing there is i don't know if you can trade somebody after they sign an offer sheet for for at least a year so it's almost like a poison i don't know if that's totally true should, i should probably check that first but that might be a bit of a poison pill by montreal to force the jets hand there to me with dubois it's, it's just as simple as you know right right now how i would look at it is i don't i don't care if it's montreal i don't care if it's wh whoever it is best offer before the draft gets pierre Luc dubois 
that that's the that's the ask around the league. If it's Montreal, great. If it's LA, super. If it's Arizona and you play in college for half the year, that's great too. We don't care. Just best offer gets it before the draft, and we can just figure out how to build our team for the upcoming season after that. That, that that's how I think. I, I think just ripping the Band-Aid off here, a la what the Minnesota Wild did a few seasons ago with their culture reshift, to me that's the best way to go with this specific instance is just let's bite the bullet, let's do it early, and then we have an idea of what we're going to do in the near future. It's funny you bring up the Wild because I sort of referenced them yesterday and I talked a lot about the courage that Bill Guerin and the organization showed in making those very tough decisions and eating a ton of money yeah. and a massive cap penalty for three seasons. But you look at how that's worked out, even knowing that Suter was going to sign with one of your division rivals yeah. in Dallas and play against you and play some significant minutes. I mean, what that did was it opened up those spots for other players. It empowered the younger players to go in and step up and be, you know, be the players that they needed them to be. The Matt Boldy, um, the likes of, of course, Kaprizov, who really is their star player right now, who's still actually injured after what happened against the uh, the Jets the last time out. But, I mean, that was there was a lot of pain involved, and they're still dealing with it right now. But look at what that's done to the hockey club. And I was out last night after the Little Brown Jug event with a couple of pals, and we were watching the end of the uh, Minnesota Avalanche game, and we got talking about this, and... Uh, I couldn't imagine a couple years ago thinking this, but we were somewhat envious of the way the Minnesota Wild look right now as a team. And even with that massive cap penalty, what they've been able to do moving on from those players and what the coach and the general manager have been able to do in completely resetting the culture of the Minnesota Wild moving forward. Um, and it shows right now is they're the number one team in the Central Division after that win last night. Yeah, yeah, and I, I made the point last year when people were saying, do they do the Calgary thing? Do the Minnesota thing and and completely just turn this around and and, and you kind of, it's almost like the rebirth of, of Jets 2.0 in a way. So um, I, I, I'm i totally okay with that. I'm totally okay with this team reload, re, whatever you want to call it. Um, basically just turning over a new leaf and saying what happened in the past isn't going to work anymore. There's no point of trying to beat a dead horse. It's kind of funny, too, Hus. The Jets right now are kind of playing like the old Minnesota Wild. They're boring as hell. They don't score any goals. So don't don't be the old Wild. Be the new Wild here. Let's let's try to get some new blood in here and see what happens. The only I I guess I guess the caveat with that is like is is Kyle Connor or Nikolai Ehlers your new Kaprizov, right? Like are they are they good enough to take uh, another leap like that? I guess that's. That's a debate to be had. The Jets don't really have. I mean, Cole Perfetti would be one, I guess. But the Wild have one of the better prospect pools in the NHL right now. That, that's one thing that's going to need a bit of a, a rejigging here over the next little bit. But I mean, I guess step one in all this, we figure the rest out later. Later, step one is the purge, if you will, and then we figure the rest out later. Yeah, no, it's a great point. So, uh, anything uh, that you might have to talk about on skates and plates uh, coming up tomorrow? Yeah, no, I, I think we might have a couple of a couple of topics to dive into. We'll we'll see what happens there. It's tough too. Like you don't want to you don't you don't want to empty the clip about off season stuff, but it feels like nobody nobody wants to talk about a playoff push because they they kind of see where it's going. But it's like, hey, we got like two months to go before the draft and all that. But um, we 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 talk about what the people want to talk about. It's it's yeah. Well, what's the best way to, to to change things up here? No shortage of topics around WST and skates and plates these days, folks. Make sure you're subscribing wherever you get your favorite podcasts or skates and plates, and give Brandon a sub. New episode tomorrow, and uh, we'll hook up next week. Coming off of Detroit, Jersey, and uh, if we do it again next Thursday, that will be the day after the Calgary game in Winnipeg, which. Uh, all of a sudden has massive implications, although it didn't look like that would be the case yeah. a few weeks ago. And of course, the Winnipeg Jets being just above the playoff line, the only playoff team that Calgary has in their schedule the rest of the way. So it's another reason why that game, you just had to have that two points against San Jose. But uh, uh, it's playoff hockey right now, whether we get legit whiteout playoff hockey or not coming up in a couple of weeks. Brandon, thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, have a good one. Talk soon. You too, pal. Okay, we got some uh, good stuff from Rick Bonus. We're going to play for you in just a couple minutes. But do have to give a big thanks to our friends at Princess Auto for the great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk, along with the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And 
Manitoba and Canada's top curlers. Princess Auto is the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. You can find them in person at Panet Road or Portage Avenue West, the two Winnipeg locations, or shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Uh, a huge thanks to the great support we received from our friends at Culligan Water over the last couple of years. Culligan Water, family-owned for over 65 years here in Winnipeg and Manitoba, hydrating the masses with everything you need when it comes to water products. Uh, water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, and drinking water systems, not to mention citywide water delivery services and commercial and industrial water products and solutions. You can pop by and see them at 1200 Sargent Avenue, 204-694-5180, or check out everything they can do for you and your family online at drinkculligan.com. And just before we hear from Rick Bonus, big cheers to our friends at Canadian Club. And I know many of us are dreaming of the snow melting and getting back to the ballpark and certainly getting back to IG Field and maybe enjoying another one of those uh, Canadian Club and Ginger Rails that were so popular at the games last year. What you don't have to wait. CC and Ginger available at your local beer store now in 473 milliliter single cans. Find it at your favorite liquor mart or your nearest beer vendor. And if you don't see it, ask for it. CC and Ginger available everywhere now. And of course, if you want the great taste of Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey and the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Pop by your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. All right, let's hear from Rick Bonus. Uh, obviously, a lot of anticipation as to what we'd hear from Bones today after, well, the post game. Um, I don't want to say incident, but uh, you know what he was hit with after the loss in San Jose. Um, came in, smile on his face, a little joke. How is everyone doing today? And then. Got down to business. Um, first things first, Bones was asked about the move of Mark Shifley to the wing heading into tomorrow's game. Rick, would you share uh, what went into the decision to move Mark to the wing? We're just looking for some offense. Um, put it, uh, you know, there's our top players and put them together. And I've, we've, we've played them at times together. I put them during periods together. Um, during a game to try to create some momentum. They went out, so they have played together a little bit. Uh, there was another game I was going to do it earlier, but we got, I think it was the Arizona guy, we got it that the lead, and we so I didn't uh, just left the lines go the way they were going because the game was going good. But listen, we need to score some goals. So um, I talked to the three of them this morning to see if, you know, let's give this a try, and they're all gung ho for it. So let's see what it looks like. Well, good to hear that the players are gung ho because um, that hasn't been something I think we'd associate with the the play of some of those uh, folks on that on that top line. Um, so Shifley playing with Dubois and Connor moving to the wing. Um, Bones expanded a little bit more on uh, what he likes about moving Shifley to the wall. Well, he again he, he's still going to take some face offs, so he lines up at wing, but on the right side he'll still be taking some face offs. But he's Marmark's a smart player. He's good. Obviously, he's a, he's great with the puck, um, and you just got to see if there's going to be chemistry developed that they read off of each other. But he's not going to be limited to going up and down the wing. He's he's got the full ice to use. All right, so there's a little bit of, uh, from uh, Bones on uh, what was sort of news today with that move of uh, Shifley to the wing with Dubois and Connor for the game tomorrow against uh, Detroit. But uh, we knew there'd be plenty of questions about what we heard from both Mark Shifley and Bones after the game at Thursday, or Tuesday in San Jose. John Liu of TSN asked Bones about his reaction to the uh, very different response from Dylan DeMello and Mark Shifley on the shot quality versus shot quantity question after the shutout loss to the Sharks. When he, you were presented with his comments about his offensive philosophy following the game on Tuesday, it, it appeared that there is a difference of an opinion. Have you? No, I don't, no, I, that was more of a response to I didn't like where that whole thing was going. Listen, Mark's word was right, and so was Mel. So to clear up this shooting thing, all we're telling our players is when we get frustrated when there's a clear shot to the net, we have somebody going to the net, and we make that extra pass, and it gets deflected, and nothing happens. 
I'm not talking about a guy standing still at the blue line with nobody in the net shooting the puck. That's not what we're talking about at all. It's when we're going on the rush and we do have someone driving the net and we do have a clear shot to take it. Uh, it's, it's those times when we don't take the shot and we make that extra pass that gets deflected. So that's what we're trying to improve on. That's, that's what I'm talking about. So both Mark and Mel were correct. That's, we want to make plays. We showed about 20 clips today to the players making great plays coming to the zone, and we had a lot of great looks off the rush the last game. We also had some great looks with tips with our defense shooting the puck. So it all goes back to getting our D consistently involved with the, with the attack. All right, there's Rick Bonus putting a bit of a fire blanket on uh, something that was uh, burning pretty bright <laughs> the last couple days around uh, Jets conversations. Um, but he did mention the defense. Here's a quick um, clip from Bones on uh, the defense from last game. There was a couple of mistakes made. There was, yeah, there was. Um, but we, we, that was one of the most offensive games we've had in a while in terms of – so our offense could have scored enough goals so, so you know, you're not so – what happens when you, lose, you get shut out and you lose? You're, pitting, you're, you're picking apart every little thing. Right? The, did we play well enough to win the game? Is the big question. Yes, we did. Now, so what? You got to score. And Reimer made some tremendous saves. Give him credit for that. What you did was here before. But when you lose and you and you, you don't score, okay. Now you you're looking at every mistake. Yeah, were well, there a couple of breakdowns on those goals? Yeah, there were. Uh, so you you were, you just you take a look at the video. You talk to the player, and you address it and you fix it. All right, so there's uh, Rick Bonus from uh, earlier today, post-practice as his team prepares for the Detroit Red Wings in another game that they absolutely have to have with Calgary just two points back in the rearview mirror. Now, uh, Hammer was there today. Let's hear what our pal Jeff Hamilton had for Rick Bonus. Um, Jeff asked Bones if he thinks he's going to get it from the guys that need to step up. Rick, I don't know if you're uncomfortable t talking about specific names of players who you don't feel are, are giving maybe they're all on a consistent basis, but are you comfortable with feeling that they're going to eventually get to that point where yes. they're going to be playing consistency? Yeah. I have a, a tremendous amount of faith in that group in there. So some nights they're off, they're off. So we got to, you know, I can't pretend they're not off. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, so when they're off, they're off. And then we, uh, we dealt with what we had to deal with today. How important is it that March, we move on? Yeah. All right, moving on to uh, this big home game tomorrow against Detroit. I mean, Jeff followed up and specifically asked about how important it is for the Winnipeg Jets to get Mark Shifley going. How important is it that Mark Shifley gets going, not just for your, you know, your need to score, scoring, and he's not the only one. I understand that, but for him as a player, for his confidence, for the way he conducts himself on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, they all want to score. They all try to score. Like again. <laughs> Reimer made some big saves, but it's not like they're not bearing down. They're bearing down. They are trying to score. Um, and again, once the, they get a couple, then yeah, then you're going to see more and more go in. All right, there's uh, Rick Bonus. Now, one more from Hammer, who um, asked about, listen, there was a lot made of the pledge that the players made to each other and signed the uh, trip out to Banff. And um, it certainly seemed like it was a great move by the team and the players to do that earlier on this season. And it was all about accountability. But, you know, with the way things have gone as of late and what we've heard from some players, um, there's been a lot of questions as to what happened to the pledge. Um, Jeff did ask about the pledge and uh, the uh, media availability this morning. Last one for me. We haven't really heard much about this pledge, but it still sticks in the room with everyone's... The, the pledge that came out of Banff that still sticks in the room and has everyone's signature. How much do you feel that the team's following that pledge that they signed at the beginning? Yeah, of the I, I, listen, they... They don't come to the rink with bad intentions. They come to the rink ready to to play and ready to work. I mean, they do every day. So, I mean, some days as humans, you're off. And you think you're working hard and you're pushing, but it's, it's, just, it's not the same as the good days when you really feel it and you can see the difference. So the more you get to know your players, you can see when they're when the good days are there, and that's the kind of standard you set for them. But you can also see when they're working, but it's, the standard's not the same. They just don't feel the energy. They don't feel it. So that when you see that, and again, you I trust my eyes, then you just you talk to the player and you move on. You address it. All right, so there's uh, Hammer with uh, with Rick Bonus. And we've actually got a couple more from Bones. Um, 
I talked yesterday about the potential of, uh, you know, switching up the lines and having Nino Niederreiter play with Adam Lowry. That is what we'll see tomorrow night. And Bones talked a little bit about moving Niederreiter to uh, Appleton and Lowry's wing. Nino, one of the best things about Nino, he's like Vladdy. They can play all three forward positions and you can move them around during the game and it doesn't bother them. They're, they're, they're competitive people and they have hockey IQ and it's easy to move them around when things aren't going the way you want them to go. But Adam and, and Apple have, uh, have played together a long time. They're top unit on our penalty kill and they do a great job against the opposition's top lines. And they had some really good looks the other night. The paddle save Ryan made on uh, Apple. That's the highlight reel, right? That goes all over but they're trying and they're putting a lot of pucks at the net uh, so they're it's not that Adam scored some big goals for us lately um, and Apple scored a big goal for us in Anaheim so they're doing a good job defensively but they're they're generating more offense than their numbers show couple more clips from Bones um, and <laughs> you know this one is interesting um, Bones talked about the challenges or was asked about the challenges this year compared to previous seasons. Of course, when he wasn't the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, this is how that sounded. Sorry, challenges for him uh, personally, not for challenges. For the- gotcha, gotcha. You always have your challenges with your team. Every day you come in here, man, it's something new. It's every day. And you got to come ready to meet the challenge, whatever that is, and deal with deal with what you see. And that's every day it's, as a coach. Even when things are going good, something's going to come up that you got to deal with. So uh, that, that never changes. Your challenges as a coach in this league, um, always expect the unexpected and just be prepared to deal with something every day. Somebody's sick, somebody's not feeling well, this guy's upset about something and those things you deal with so the way the team is going um, we, we constantly we just we stay as positive as we can we reinforce the, we challenge them on the things that we know we can do better on a consistent basis they're constantly challenged on that but they're you know, constantly being pushed to keep moving forward but to answer your question you know, those challenges are every coach every day in this league you're, there's something coming up all right, still a smile on his face despite everything happening around him with this hockey club. Uh, and listen, we have seen a number of times in chat over the last number of weeks, people suggest, I wonder if Bones regrets coming back and, you know, but taking this job and not being retired right now. Well, Judy Owen asked him about that. This is, uh, this is the back and forth between Judy and Rick Bonus on that topic from today. The last couple of weeks, I've had a couple of friends say, geez, I wonder if Rick Bonus re- regrets not retiring. So I said, well, I don't oh know. I'll, I'll ask him. Never. No, I, I love it. Still love it. So I'm still here. <laughs> I tell Judy every day, the morning I wake up and I don't want to go to the rink, then we know it's time. We, not even, I love this challenge right now. I love the challenge. I don't want to be where we are. Trust me, I prefer to be back where we were. But I love the challenge that's in front of us. You know, I had the guys talk this morning about the year they went to the semis and the whole city was, uh, you know, was on fire. It was electric. Well, that's what we want to bring back to the city. All right. Great stuff from uh, from Rick Bonus and a great question from Judy Owen as well. Of course, we'll have more from the coach and the team tomorrow on Winnipeg Sports Talk as the Jets get ready to host the Detroit Red Wings Friday night in the uh, return of Andrew Kopp. Uh, great turnout again today for the show. And thanks to everyone as well as the new subscribers pushing 8.8. Or actually, we just got to 8.89. Uh, if you are new and you haven't already, folks, make sure to hit that red subscribe button. Um, we'll have the latest content for you, whether you're able to join us live on YouTube or joining us afterwards. And uh, if you're on YouTube, Winnipeg Sports Talk, also available wherever you get your favorite audio podcasts. Just search uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk and make sure to hit that subscribe button as well. And while you're at it, if you're with us on YouTube, hit that thumbs up. We uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, hey, if you missed the start of the show, we did a little bit of a rundown of a great night we had last night at Little Brown Jug. I have to say uh, thanks to, to Cal and the great staff there for uh hosting all of us and obviously their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk and everyone seemed to really like that new generic lager that we've been uh, talking about for the last little bit. I got to try it for the first time. It was phenomenal. Got to take a few home as well. Uh, if you haven't tried it, generic lager is just launched. It's your basic lager, just better. 
impressively standard in the best way, light and clean to taste with a mellow flavor and crisp finish. Now Manitoba can support local without having to move away from the domestic taste they've come to expect with a light beer. Grab it today downtown at the brewery and tap room at Little Brown Jug or wherever they sell great beer. And uh, hey, a big thanks to Nick and Nikki DQ for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Four locations in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba. DQ Northgate, DQ Polar Park, DQ St. Anne's, and the DQ in Niverville. Seems like this winter's never going to end, but uh, it's just about blizzard season. Well, hell, it's always blizzard season when you're cranking out delicious ice cream treats like Nick and Nikki are. Pop down maybe get a taste of spring a little earlier than mother nature has for us with a blizzard today and check out those great stack burgers. They've got too at your local Nick and Nikki DQ. And if you do need a DQ ice cream cake or blizzard cake, hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. They'll get it ready for you. Custom made for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nikki DQs. All right. We've talked a lot of jets so far today, but it is opening day in the majors. And uh, I know a lot of excited Jays fans getting ready for first pitch at the top of the hour. Just before we uh, get ready for Blue Jays season uh, to start, we caught up a little earlier with J.D. Bunkus of Sportsnet and uh, talked to him about um, being at that Canada soccer game in Toronto a couple days ago, as well as the expectations and vibes around the Jays going into game one of 162 in a few minutes coming up at the top of the hour. Here's a conversation with JD. JD, what's up? How are you? Yeah, brother. I was just thinking about how, you know, when you have a self-titled podcast, it would have been amazing if you just introduced somebody else. You're like the host of the JD Bunkus podcast, Rick Jones. What's up, Rick? <laughs> like, how how are we doing today? Someone should do that. Just name a podcast after someone famous, and it's not them. Yeah, like, just, that's you know, the gimmick. <laughs> like the what? Will Smith podcast. Just. JD Bunkus, yeah. host of the Will Smith podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, before we get to this upcoming baseball season, I know you yeah. were at uh, BMO the other day checking out Canada's men's national team. Sort of the first time we've heard anything about the team playing as opposed to all the dysfunction amongst Canada soccer. Um, what what were your takeaways from that? Obviously, it was a great game for the team, and they'll move on to play Panama in the semifinals of this event. But uh, crowd-wise, atmosphere around Canada soccer, there's yeah. a lot of hardcores when it comes to that team. I saw them in Qatar um, but I do wonder what the atmosphere around that entire program is right now with the team getting back on the pitch and everything happening behind the scenes. So, Huss, this is the thing that's so frustrating is the team is so exciting and they're likable and they're fast and they're winning and we can't just have fun. We can't just go to the game and watch these guys dominate and go, man, this is the era of Canada soccer. There's got to be all this. Can we swear? What are we doing here? Yeah, no? go for it. Go for it. It's all this bullshit nonstop behind the scenes of like, oh, and they're not getting paid. And Canada soccer is dysfunctional. And who's actually running this thing? And how the hell did they do this deal? And did they make false promises to the women's program? And are they actually going to get to a place where there's equality? Are we building right grassroots programs? And like, for me... I, I'm not a day one soccer diehard in this country, you know, like I'm, I'm not the likes of, you know, the Brandon Dobbies, the James Sharmans, the, you know, Sid Six Arrows, the people who've been with this program for forever and ever and ever. And like, I, I can't remember a, a team like this where you're just, you want to enjoy this incredible product. And then every time they're off the pitch, you go, well, you know, you couldn't even buy a Davies Jersey. They couldn't even get a world cup kit together for this team. Like, it's annoying, but the game itself, that's what I'm going to focus on, buddy, because I just feel, I don't, I don't want to feel like apathetic about it because that's lame, but part of me is right now just, I can't deal with this stuff. Like I, I can't deal with this behind the scenes stuff. I'm not involved in it. I don't want to spend hours and hours behind it. Like I'm not someone who got into deflate gate, right? I'm like, let me see a Patriots game. It's Tom Brady playing or not. I don't want to spend 85 hours on deflate gate. I just want to watch the product. I came here for the sports, not the drama behind it in terms of especially this kind of drama where it comes to payment and corruption and all this different stuff. Like, give it to me in a Netflix doc 10 years from now, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll watch it then when these guys can't play. My takeaway from the soccer game itself was 13,000 people in the stadium. Probably should have been more. They probably should have sold some upper deck tickets, but I guess it got pinched just a tiny bit. There was Kyle Lowry in town that night. 
It was kind of a sneaky, all of a sudden, wait, Canada's playing an important game in Toronto. It didn't feel like really well marketed. Didn't really feel like they were on top of pushing, making sure that everybody knew that they were here. It felt like very much a diehards game, which was cool because the atmosphere was excited. It was diehard soccer fans who were talking about the team. There was opinions flying everywhere. There were chants going. It felt real. Like it really felt like the people that were in the house were big time soccer fans. What I want to see is more people like me getting into these games and showing up for these games and going, yo, I'm a newer fan to this. Now I want to feel connected to this team and I want to follow them on their next run to the world cup and have them be like my team, my program, the group that we show up for all the big games for, man, they're so fast. Huss. Like they have Tejon Buchanan. They had Alfonso Davies show up and now they've got that kid Kone who also has those electric legs, those electric movement to his game. And they're playing Honduras who not too long ago beat the shit out of us. Eight, one an embarrassing yeah. game. We roasted those boys. They scored a goal fluke city. Like it was a beat down. We are really good at soccer and we have just got some athletes on this team who can just, embarrass guys and so from an actual like aesthetic product of what you get to see on the pitch to me this is one of the best things that's happening in the country right now like this is truly one of the best products you can go see live you're seeing top tier athletes world-class guys who play on major clubs around the globe who are reaching the pinnacle peak whatever the hell you want to say of their careers i love it i cannot get enough of it i'm completely addicted I just want to tap into it. I wish they played here more often. I wish I had the means like you, Mr. Rich, to just travel to Qatar (laughs) on a a whim, but I don't have the kind of juice of Andrew Patterson. Like, but yeah, dude, I love it. I'm, I'm completely obsessed. I love the team. I'm so interested in the characters. I had Richie LaRae on my podcast recently. I had a blast talking with him. Good personalities, top tier talent, speed, great fans. The actual product itself, I don't think you can match it. It's just, like I said, that bullshit off the pitch that's just draining. You know, you're exactly right. And, and I mean, it speaks to what Herdman and the players have done. And the women, too. I'll include them in this with the incredible success they've had. um, To be able to do what they've done despite the incompetence and the bureaucracy that has played Canada soccer for so long. Um, Let's get to the Jays. Because I know that you all have been waiting for the Lightning Leaf series since about the middle of November, knowing last that year. it was coming. Yeah, well, yeah, pretty much since last April. Yeah. Um, and that will kind of take over in a few weeks. But um, before we even get to the team, what's the vibe like around Toronto about this upcoming Jays season? Um, and how would you compare it to maybe last year with this young team? It sort of seems like more is expected, but maybe a little bit more of a experienced business like Jays team, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, last year we had the Vlad quote of. You had the trailer, now this is the movie. And it was hype. It was hype, 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 hype. They brought in Gossman. They had Barrios under deal. They missed the playoffs by a hair. And it was, these guys got to go out and dominate and they're World Series favorites and all this different stuff. I think the hype was a little bit more last year from just a fan palpitation uh, standpoint where people just were left wanting more. And that's the way that it is with any good show, right? You want to be left wanting more. You don't want to have a disappointing finale. You want to know what's next. And that's the advantage they had going into last season. This year, they lost in embarrassing fashion to the Mariners. And they had an off season that saw a lot of fan favorites go away. We had an off season where there wasn't a ton of buzzy quotes coming out of Jay's camp. You know, it was just business as usual. And that's the thing you kept getting. So from a media standpoint, and a sell in the team standpoint, it's not as engaging and interesting as Vladdy coming off an MVP caliber season. What can he be trailer? Not the movie, but from an actual, yo, what is this team standpoint? That is the word mature. That's the other thing. Attention to detail. Those are the things you hear coming out of camp. You're not hearing Vladdy say that same stuff about the trailer, the movie giving you the hype, because I think these guys are done talking about it. I think they want to do it. You look at the complexion of the team now where it's like another year older Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Matt Chapman, big-time vet leader. Bring in Chris Bassett, big-time vet leader. Dalton Varsho, ball player. You know, just a Kevin Kiermeyer. They brought in vets. They brought in guys who want to win. They brought in guys who pay attention to detail with this ball club. And so what I think you're going to see is just the, the Blue Jays growing up a bit this year. 
this year, there's a lot of expectation for them to take a step. I think the fan base is a little bit more realistic about, you know, just racking up win after win after win, like World Series wise. But no, this is expected to be one of the best five teams in all of baseball this year. They're expected to be World Series contenders. And I think that their approach this offseason was, hey, we, we got to clean up some stuff. We've got to be a better defensive ball club. We got to be a more balanced ball club. We have to be more intense in our approach with these games. And that's going to be the difference between what we saw last year and what we can achieve this year. So I, I just, I'm so excited. I'm so high on this team. I can't wait for it to hit the ground running. And yeah, I cannot believe that it's it's like now we're getting baseball now. You know, I, I, I've got to ask about John Schneider. He of course came yep. in, you know, midway through the season. And this is his first spring training as the manager. How much yep. of the different um, vibe around the team, expectations, what not come from the guy in charge? I think people like Schneider. He got he got criticized for some of the moves in the postseason last year. There was definitely a little bit of chatter about, hey, if Terry Francona is available, don't you have to do it? And I think privately, you know, you give truth serum to the front office. They looked into it. All right. They, they wanted to see what Terry was doing before they locked in Schneider. But this is a guy who has known a lot of these players from the minor leagues up. This is a guy who is completely bought into the vision of the Toronto Blue Jays, who knows everybody from, you know, the training staff to like, I was talking to John Gibbons the other day and he just wrote a book and he was talking about when he came, when they came in there in 2015, 2016, right? All the different turnover of the personnel that are in the building with a new front office. And you don't think about that as a sports fan, right? You think just, Oh yeah, the guys on the field. No, no, no. They're bringing in different people that you got to deal with different coaches, different trainers, all that kind of stuff. John Schneider is connected to everybody in this organization in one way or another. And so I do think that he is just going to be one of those guys that has a really good pulse of what's going on and what guys need. He seems to be a player's manager, but he's also somebody that, you know, what I like in a baseball manager is someone who looks like they can kick the shit out of you if you <laughs> yeah. do something wrong. And I like that he kind of has that vibe of, yo, don't mess with me. <laughs> like I will, I will beat you like I will I will give you some attitude back I'm not afraid to go toe to toe with somebody and get red in the face and so yeah I just think from a strategic standpoint he's bought into the vision of what the Blue Jays do but he definitely has a more of a traditional baseball approach where I think that he's not afraid to go with his gut at times he's connected to these players and yeah I think that he's just like got a really good demeanor I find John Schneider like an incredibly easy guy to root for and a, a guy that yeah I think I, I really do believe in as a, a going to be a very good manager for this baseball team. Sportsnet's J.D. Bunkus with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk, getting ready for game one of 162 for the Toronto Blue Jays. J.D., as far as the offseason goes, I mean, from a management perspective, what did um, Akin Shapiro and the gang identify as their biggest needs, and how would you um, how would you characterize that they did in filling those? Yeah, so I think that it was those three, it was three things. Defense, balance, and depth. And I think that they addressed those all extremely well. Um, it was weird because the off season got off to a pretty, pretty bad start. I would say they were very, very in on Brandon Nimmo. It seemed, and it kind of came down to how is this team going to address the outfield without being able to get Brandon Nimmo. They need to move George Springer out of center field consistently to make sure that he can stay healthy as an aging player. How are they going to be able to do this without giving Nimmo money? The Nimmo money got insane. All of a sudden, the big players and free agency started snapping up all the big names. And Toronto looked like they were on the outside looking in. And people went, boy, oh boy, oh boy. They traded to Oscar Hernandez, uh, one of the franchise's most popular players, a silver slugger, an elite bat. And they brought back a relief pitcher who wasn't even going to be, you know, the eighth inning guy. Uh, who wasn't a fireballer was somebody that's like a, you know, gets you out with a variety of kind of trick pitches. You went, damn, this is starting to look bad. And then as the off season went on, these guys kind of kept plugging away, move by move, adding some veteran presence in Kevin Kiermaier, making a massive trade where they go out and get Dalton Varsho, someone that they feel like is just hitting his prime as a lefty bat, but also someone that can give them plus, plus, plus defense. They went out and added veterans like Brandon Belt, who last time he was healthy, the guy was a nasty slugger, someone that gives him a little bit of insurance at first base with Vladdy, who can give him an off day, but also can step in there as a DH. Um, they went out and made their bullpen deeper. They went out there and they grabbed Chris Bassett. Again, someone that's going to replace Ross Stripling and give them a, a real legitimate top three starter who's going to be a good innings eater for this team, but also be a vocal leader in the, in the clubhouse. So, 
I think if you look at it, it was a team that had a lot of immaturity. I think a lot of that's gone. That didn't have a lot of balance throughout their lineup. Now they've got a ton of left-handed hitting. And a team that really struggled defensively at times all of a sudden has three dudes who can play the outfield that are all plus center fielders defensively. And so when you're just, again, looking at this team for how are they going to take steps, they're not going to, they might not hit as many home runs because of losing Teos Hernandez and Lourdes Gurriel Jr. But I think all around the front office did a very good job of finding ways to give them a big plus in the areas that they were most in deficit last year. Well, and, and let's talk about the defense in the outfield for a minute. I mean, the Varsho trade was one of the biggest moves of the offseason. I'm not sure how familiar casual fans were with Varsho, but he does come with an a crazy, a crazy defensive pedigree. I mean, we've seen Kiermaier make incredible plays consistently throughout his career. And then they also have the option now to move George Springer from center to left field. Um, I mean, you watch this team every day. How much How much will that help the pitching staff with the makeup of the Jays outfield right now when they are in the field and not batting? Jays had this outfield last year. Well, one, they wouldn't have had that huge lead because Teo hit all those bombs. But okay. if they're closing out that baseball game with that final play, Bo and Springer running into each other, that's, that's not happening with this Blue Jays outfield. And so I think that that is part of the, the thinking here is they are going to be able to make up a lot of the runs that they're going to lose with Teoscar and Lourdes going out the door with one, the fences coming in and having lefty guys like Varsho who do have power that can replicate some of that stuff with like basically the new power alley that's been created at Rogers center with the field dimensions, but also that I think these guys expect to have the best defensive outfield than maybe all of baseball. Like I don't think that's an unrealistic expectation for them if they end up staying healthy. If Kiermaier is a big part of this, which it appears he is going to be, then yeah, you have a gold glove caliber guy who is going to be out there patrolling a ton. Varsho is someone who has been a gold glove caliber guy and Springer who, you know, has lost a little bit of a step, a lost a little bit of something, having him not have to just cover that much field all the time and maybe have a few less him diving around for baseballs or him crashing the wall, I think is going to be huge. So no, dude, I, I think if you're a baseball fan, and you like outfield defense, you remember the Kevin Pillar diving around and uh, making nasty plays in the outfield and saving runs. Uh, you're going to like this Blue Jays outfield. You, you're, what was that, the old Moors lines? Like, you're going to like the way you look. It's like, that's how I feel <laughs> with, like, you're going to like the way you look defensively. Uh, as far as pitching goes, I mean, many of the uh, top players back last year, and maybe speaking of back, I mean, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I was the one guy who did not quit on my guy Kikuchi, and he has looked great in spring. Yeah. I, is there a comeback player of the year award in Major League Baseball? Because oh my God. I want him to have a great season and do that. But maybe quickly touch on yeah. um, how people actually are legitimately excited for a second chance for Kikuchi and the way the rest of that uh, rotation looks like going into the season. I think people are guarded with Kikuchi. Because for sure. <laughs> here's the thing. He's always had the stuff, dude. And him in spring... He's has walks went up a little bit throughout the later part of the spring. I didn't watch every one of his starts. He definitely looked better. They have a good pitching coach in Pete Walker. They brought Pat Hankin back. It feels like they have some pretty good game plans for some of the guys that struggled last year, but with Kikuchi, it's between the ears. So until I see it in regular season games, until he's doing it in tight spots, then yeah, it doesn't mean a whole lot to me. What I will say with Kikuchi is that, they kind of need him to be good right away because Mitch White isn't healthy and they don't really have a lot of starting pitching depth. After him, it's like Zach Thompson, Flyer. Like They don't have that one arm that's ready and waiting to all of a sudden usurp him and take his spot. There's not a ton of competition for him right now. So I, I did buy a little Kikuchi stock during the offseason because it was at an all-time low. But yeah, I might be selling it even before his first outing because <laughs> maybe that could be at its all-time high. What I, what I believe in with him is he has the stuff he doesn't need to go as deep into ball games because they have a deep bullpen. They've got eight guys that you really can feel like you can rely upon. And they've got good starting pitchers before him that they don't feel as though we're going to tax the bullpen a ton early throughout the course of the season. That's going to give him a little bit more wriggle room to say, yo, give us those five and dive starts, you know, just give us those five innings. If you end up out in the fourth every once in a while, because you've turned over the lineup a couple of times, no big deal. We've got the bullpen depth for that this season. So I just think, he at least has a little bit of pressure off of him. He at least is coming off of a good spring. He's more familiar with the, the coaching staff. 
They're more familiar with his game. And now you've got a bullpen that can support him a little bit better should he struggle. So yeah, I'm a little higher on Kikuchi, but yeah, I want to. I need to see it in the meaningful games. Who do you think is going to be the horse of the uh, of the rot- rotation? Is it going to be Manoa? No doubt about it. And uh, yes. and and who? I mean, I guess best case scenario is you have some guys pushing for that spot at yeah. the top of the order. No, I think that they have two guys. Like they have two dudes who could be aces, Manoa and Gossman. And if you look at even their fan grass from last year, there was a case that both of those guys were in the mix for the Cy Young. They are that caliber of pitcher. Manoa in his career, I think I put it together for my show today. I'm going off memory on this, but 25 and nine in his career with a 260 ERA. <laughs> That's pretty good. That'll get it done. <laughs> you know, that'll get it done. He's the opening day starter. But what I love about Manoa more than anything is he is just a dog, man. Like that guy just eats, sleeps, breathes baseball. He is a leader, natural born. He has got those qualities that you cannot teach. He commands your respect. He demands your respects, whatever. Like if you're not going to give it to him, he's going to take it from you. And I just think he is a gravitational force, dude. I just believe in that guy. He believes in it. He goes out there. He has that confidence. He has that aura. And then he can go out there and give you the plus stuff too. So I think for other fan bases, they might get annoyed by the guy because he is so successful. He is vocal. He'll show somebody up. He's not going to play the traditional, uh, yeah, full sportsmanship mode that I think a lot of guys in the game do. But yeah, to me, it's like, it just feels as though this guy can take an unlimited amount of innings. I don't want to jinx him, but feels like he's one of those guys that just has the ability to stay healthy. He's got the the durability gene, whatever that is. And he loves to compete. He loves those big moments. He wants the ball more. He's the guy that you have to plead with to come out of a baseball game. To me, he's the horse. They got Gossman is a stud. I absolutely love the guy. Amazing signing. A guy that could absolutely finish the year with better numbers than Manoa. But if you're asking me to bet on a guy, I'm going to bet on the guy with the most belief in himself than just about any pitcher I've ever seen wear a Blue Jays uniform. And that's Alec Manoa. Well, we'll look forward to seeing uh, him set the tone against the Cardinals on uh, Thursday afternoon on opening day. JD, this has been so much fun. Great to have you back on the program. Yes. Be well. Enjoy the ups and downs of the rear range of Leaf season, however yeah. long it goes. And uh, good thing for you is you'll have a very exciting baseball team to talk about whenever uh, that playoff run ends. Dude, we got the Masters, Leafs playoff games, Final Four, Canadian soccer's back, Blue Jays are back, Stanley Cup playoffs are here. Like, I'll be fine to find ways to distract myself if the Leafs disappoint me and everyone here again. We'll just go right into Jay's mode immediately. You're the best, dude. Thanks for doing this. You too, Huss. Oh, man, that was a lot of fun. Uh, Great to have my pal J.D. Bunkus join us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, I know many of you, the last thing you want to hear is more uh, any Leafs talk. But if you uh, are so inclined... You can check it out. He and uh, Justin Bourne do uh, Leafs post game, um, and of course, also check out the JD Bunkers podcast wherever you get your favorite pods. All right, stay uh, stick around, folks. We've got a great picture of Dustin Bufflin in the Bass Masters Classic aftermath. We're going to show you in just a second, but uh, just as they do the anthems in St. Louis. Let's get to the uh, cool bet lines today. We'll start it off in the National Hockey League. Busy slate tonight. Although uh, no Preds, no Flames, no Jets tonight. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say that. The Predators are in Pittsburgh. They're a plus 172 underdog against the Penguins. Um, Sens minus 170 faves at home against Philly. Rangers, Devils going at it. Potential playoff preview. Devils minus 130 faves at home. Uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, plus 350 dogs to the Boston Bruins, who just lost at home to the Predators of all teams, uh, minus 452 for the Bruins. Uh, we've also got the Caps and Lightning. Lightning coming off that big win against Carolina. They're minus 205 faves. The Canes, minus 237 in Detroit to take on the Red Wings, who, of course, are here tomorrow for the Winnipeg Jets. Left we'll to travel after the game. Blues and Blackhawks, minus 148. For St. Louis, Kings and Oilers, looking forward to that one tonight. Oilers, a minus 164 favorite. Ducks and Kraken, Seattle, minus 379. And the Vegas Golden Knights, minus 184 faves in San Jose to take on the Sharks. One other game that I did not mention. 
The Florida Panthers, who uh, squeezed one out in OT yesterday, taking on the Montreal Canadiens. Panthers are minus two of five favorites. What stood out about that game, though, Remo, that uh, was getting a lot of run on social media was an absolute nuclear meltdown by Paul Maurice on the bench to his Florida team. And uh, whatever the coach said, um, I believe he said F off six to seven times during that rant. Um, it ended up working as they got a absolutely mandatory two points as they try to chase down Pittsburgh for that final wild card. Yeah, we were busy doing sports uh, trivia, a little brown jug, so I really didn't see that until today. And, I mean, it's gotten to the point where, you know, Maurice, Paul Maurice getting angry on the bench has become just such a meme and uh, thing, you know, that happens so frequently. And he really did lose it. And, you know, he's not here anymore, but we definitely miss uh, stuff like that where he's yelling his face is all red he's screaming uh you know i guess it works right yeah plenty of f-bombs last night from uh from pomo um and just quickly uh jays ended up uh, that game when we did the lock shop earlier today it was basically a pick of minus 106 on either side i think it got up to about minus 109 uh but they're just about to uh kick off first pitch down at bush stadium other games a little later on, Chicago, Houston, Colorado, San Diego. I'm riding with Otani on the run line, minus one and a half against the Angel, uh, the Athletics a little later on. Uh, D-backs and Chargers as well, Guardians and Mariners. And uh, Mets and Marlins playing uh, earlier today, Yankees as well. All the odds are up there. You can still get in on Major League Baseball futures if you want. Those won't be up for very long. So get on over at CoolBet. And if you haven't played a CoolBet before and you want to, use the promo code WST when you're making your first deposit. It'll give you a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on your first deposit over at CoolBet. All right, Remo, before we take off and go watch this Jays game, um, sounds like Buff's better half dropped a pretty great photo on the gram of uh, a little more of the Gussie celebration from the big Bassmasters Classic that we talked about earlier this yeah, week. Yeah, this was a big story this week. Check out Tuesday show where we had Jeff Gustafson from Kenora who won the Bassmaster Classic and took home three hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Here he is, Dustin Bufflin. Uh, shout out to his wife Emily on Instagram, who's pretty active. She posted this picture, and there he is. They're in a, a boat filled with confetti. This was the boat he was in during the thing with the trophy, and there's Buff holding up the flag, and that's their their team that uh, hit the town in Knoxville partying and Bassmaster Classic has record ratings this year for it. Uh, Fox or Bassmaster tweeting out that 4.5 million viewers across two days on Fox and FSN, wow. wa- FS1 watched it, 4.5 mil. And then the, uh, the final hours of championship, championship Sunday's live coverage on Fox, the most watched Bassmaster telecast on any network since 2009 and 30, 32% more than last year's classic telecast. So a lot of people there watching Gussie who would take, take it down and win the trophy. And, hey, and check out Tuesday's show where he came on, and I will put that up separately uh, later on this weekend. That was what an awesome thing for a guy from Kenora, Ontario. He's down. such a good dude. And, uh, yeah, Gussie brings him out, the ratings machine. Yeah, well, you get the and, international uh, audience <clears throat> now. <laughs> and you know what? I'll say this, guys. Um, if you're uh, if you're looking to lock down a lady, find an Emily Bufflin out there. One that will let you just take off in the middle of vacation, drop you off at the airport with nothing more than socks or than a sandals, shorts, and a t-shirt, so you can go hang with your buddy as he wins the biggest fishing event in the world. Um, obviously, he got a great thing going on. Great young kid. Sounds like Buff. As we heard from Gussie in the interview really enjoying life right now. And a big smile on the big fella's face as uh, he was hanging with Gussie in the biggest event and the biggest win of his career and the biggest on the Bassmasters uh, Tour. And, oh, by the way, won 300 grand at the same time doing it. All right, great show today. Uh, Thanks again to everyone that came out to hang with us yesterday at Little Brown Jug. So much fun seeing all of you. Stay tuned for details on our next event. We'll uh, wait till that patio gets open. We'll find a good night to get back outside like we did it for the first one. Congratulations to the sports rabbis and uh, Dan Jets fan and his team for the tie at the top. We have, we do have cool bet lines. As I mentioned to the sports rabbis yesterday, 
they have already been listed as minus 160 favorites for the third event of Winnipeg Sports Talk Sports Trivia down at Little Brown Jug. But, uh, hey, we got some baseball to watch. Enjoy opening day. Have a great night tonight. Lots of hockey to watch as well. And we'll get back at it tomorrow. Ken Weeb is back from being Worldwide Weeb. He's now Winnipeg Weeb again. He'll join us tomorrow ahead of the Jets and Detroit Red Wings. And we're also going to talk to Brian Munns and have Munsey set up the ice playoff series with Medicine Hat that gets going tomorrow night, 7 p.m., and then 6 o'clock on Saturday. Huge thanks to J.D. Bunkus. Awesome conversation. Really enjoyed that. Brandon Rewicki and, of course, Trevor Kidd, Michael Remus, and all of you for making us a part of your day. Hit that red subscribe button if you haven't already, and make sure to find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts at Winnipeg Sports Talk. Big thanks to all the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow on a game day edition. Do or die for the Jets. The Detroit Red Wings in town tomorrow. We'll be all over it. Getting you ready for the weekend on Winnipeg Sports Talk. See you tomorrow, 1 o'clock right here on YouTube. Have a good one. Oh, my God. Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.